This is the Comics Alternative, the world's smartest comics podcast, episode 304, a look at the January previews catalog. Good old acquaintance, be forgot and never brought to mind. Happy New Year, and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Sturge, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. Yes, and for the very first regular review episode of 2019, we're going to, of course, look at the latest previews catalog. And this is actually a special episode of the preview show, but we'll get to that in a minute. But first, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you can find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price, and every single month you're going to find some mind-blowing specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price, sometimes 50% off cover, but occasionally you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. That's right, Derek, and... One of the most impressive opportunities for specials are their bundles. And right now, if you go, you can get a Vertigo bundle or a Valiant bundle or a Jinx World bundle for 50% off. You really can't go wrong with the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. And you can bet your bottom dollar, whatever the hell a bottom dollar is, that everything that we talk about on this preview show is going to be at incredible discounts at Discount Comic Book Service this month. So go to DCBService.com. They will take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Well, Happy New Year, Sturge. Happy New Year to you, Derek. So, yeah, and we're going to start off the new year by doing something different. Uh, If you recall, several weeks ago, we did a little experiment where we recorded a couple of our episodes, our weekly review episodes, via live streaming on Google Hangouts. We'd never done that before. That turned out pretty good. So in the continued spirit of experimentation, especially in the new year, we thought we'd do another little experiment. We have someone who works with the Diamond Distributor universe, I guess. And specifically, he does work with Previews World, Troy Jeffrey Allen. He got in touch with us, and he says he really enjoys our monthly preview shows. And since he works with Previews and Diamond, he wondered if we may want to have him be a part of the conversation the next time we do a preview show. And we said yes. Because we're good like that. We're good like that. And also, it added a different perspective. And so what you're about to hear is my and Sturge's look at the January previews catalog, along with Troy, and he provides us with quite a bit of uh, a number of insights about, you know, I guess the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, We even ask him a few questions, like, how do you guys decide this? You know, what is certified cool? Uh, How do you categorize things? What about the relatively recent rearrangement of the catalog? Have you had the uh, blowback from that? So it did provide a completely different perspective on our preview show. Yeah, it was really cool to hear that. So why don't we take a listen? The old year's gone and I'm all through. I'm turning this old world over to you. I'm ready to go. Brand spanking new and I'm wishing I had. This is a first with the Comics Alternative. Uh, In fact, it's interesting because Sturge and I just a few weeks ago did a first for the Comics Alternative, and that was two weeks we streamed live the recording of our episode. And so in that uh, mindset of experimenting, uh, we're going to do something different for our January preview show. This time around, Sturge and I have a third individual who is joining us for the conversation, and he is Troy Jeffrey Allen, 
and he works with consumer outreach, I think it is, at Diamond Distributors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, – my, so my job here is like basically to uh, always remind people to stop at comic shops, uh, to support their LCS, um, and really just kind of get across to people that comic shops are community centers. And it's important that you protect the culture of the comic shop because that is very key to the world of comics. So, Yeah. <laughs> That's funny you said that. I, I My dissertation study was on adult people who read comics, and more mm-hmm. than one person talked about the comic shop. as, com- Or what I was doing was like, this is community service for the comic yeah, shop. Yeah, it is. I mean, it really is, man. Like, I've, I've read quite a few uh, uh, pieces by by certain by uh, adults who are like, if it wasn't for comics, I don't know where I would be. And that's a real thing. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very, very much community center. So, yes, let's talk comics. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's really interesting how this thing – came about, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, Troy, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had responded to one of our tweets. I, it, it could have been the December preview show. Mm. And then you introduced yourself and was started to suggest ways that maybe you could help us out or contribute to us doing preview shows. And then you and I went back and forth and decided, hey, we'll, we'll give this a try for January. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I literally look at this thing every single month, and I, I dog ear, I dog ear pages, like you know, like I'm ordering stuff too. So, to me, this is uh, this is what I normally would do. So, yeah, I'm excited to to dive in with you guys. Cool. And you know, if this doesn't go completely off the rails, then uh, we may have you on every now and again throughout the year. Yeah. Okay. Nice. 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 Okay. Yeah. Welcome. I'm excited. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I am too. Although we we should warn listeners that you know our preview shows are usually longer than than <laughs> others. This may be even longer. We'll see though. We'll we'll try not to to, to go too crazy. There you go. I'm, I'm going to be so terse. I'll be like, <laughs> I like this book. Go look at it. Yeah. Move on. Next page. <laughs> you'll you'll be like the John McLaughlin of that's right of, of comics podcasts. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So in the January catalog, one of the things that I always look forward to is to see what kind of free comic book day offerings are listed. Mm-hmm. And we have the listings in this catalog. Yes, we do. And it begins on page, what, 30, 31, 30, 32. And Mm -hmm. uh, I wondered if there are any outstanding free comic book day titles that either of you may want to point out. Um, I would say definitely off the top for me personally, um, the Welcome to the Wheaton Verse book that uh, Boom Studios is doing. Uh, caught my attention for sure. Like uh, these characters, so Firefly has gone to Boom Studios. So mm-hmm. he previously was a Dark Horse, and so has Buffy. And Buffy's getting kind of what seems like a soft reboot. And Firefly is extending, is actually expanding on the TV show, which I know makes a lot of people, including myself, happy. Um, and I think this might be a good jumping on point for people who are familiar, because it seems like Josh Sweeten fans and comic book fans are in this Venn diagram, like somewhere in the middle. <laughs> so I think this is like, you know, I think this is a good op- uh, entry point for people. Hmm. Yeah, okay. I, I looked yeah. at that, too. And I also looked at a, another, I, I'd, I'd read some of the Firefly books because I liked Firefly the series and it kind of ended way too soon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but also on that page 33, I looked at it's the Dark Horse one, but Stranger Things and Black Hammer. Oh, yeah. And probably more for the Black Hammer half of the book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But that that seemed like an interesting kind of intro into two brand new heroes. So I guess those are two series that are coming soon. Mm-hmm. So that that was kind of intriguing to me. Um, Stranger Things, like I get why Buffy is uh, a, a, like popular because they don't make Buffy anymore. But right, Stranger yeah. Things, I'm always a little bit loath to like look at an adaptation for something that's coming out. Like right, there's yeah. a part of me that's like, oh, this doesn't count. So right, 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 right. Which might be a bad part. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. I mean, like, I, well, I, you know, d- depending on your fandom, that's probably true. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so I get that. Um, also, Interceptor. Um, I saw. I just saw the Donny Cates book, um, which is from Vault Comics. Or that's a part of a trilogy, I believe, that uh, Donny Cates was doing way before he started doing all this Marvel stuff recently. So mm-hmm. that might be something worth checking out. You know, I had my eye on what Sturge had mentioned, the Dark Horse. Uh, Stranger Things, Black Hammer, mm-hmm. and more on the Black Hammer side. 
I mean, I, I haven't even tried their adaptation of Stranger Things. It may be great. I just haven't taken the time to look at it yet. I think the one selection, though, that I'm most excited about is it's almost the same every year. Uh, Fantagraphics and Drawn in Quarterly are two mm-hmm. go-to publishers for me. And this year, Fantagraphics is offering uh, our favorite thing is my favorite thing is monsters. <laughs> so we have apparently selections from the first my favorite thing is monsters, but we also have some samplings from my favorite thing is monsters volume two, which should be coming out in the fall, at least according to the solicit here. And I say, at least according to the solicit, I, I've talked with a couple of people at Fanographics, and they have admitted that things are really slow on the first or the second volume coming out. It was supposed to come mm. out earlier this year, then later this year, and so now it's going to be in the fall of 2019. But I lo- I loved uh, Emil Ferris's first volume of this. It was mm. one of my absolute favorites from last year. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking forward to this, and this will be the big free comic book day pick for me. Now, and that's on page 39. On on 40, there are a couple of other things that I found really interesting. Mm-hmm. One is from Kadansha. I'm a big fan of Kadansha. We talk about Kadansha titles quite frequently on our monthly yeah. manga show. This yeah. one is the Kadansha Comics All Ages Manga Sampler, which I think would be cool. Uh, mm-hmm. And in fact, it's something that the co-hosts of our Young Readers series may mm-hmm. want to check out as well. But also, one right beside that is from Humanoids, H1 Ignition. And this is part of, or I guess, a sampling of their H1 universe. Mm-hmm. I'd heard about this, but I don't know much about it. But I guess this selection from Ignition is written by Mark Wade, among others. And so yeah. what, yeah, what yeah. do you guys know about uh Humanoids H1 initiative. Um, it's I well I could tell you that it's like it's basically their superhero line. Okay, they're that's they're, what they're going both feet into superheroes, and Mark Wade is overseeing the entire line. And so what you're getting more than likely is okay. uh, not a story written by three people, as it says here, but like an entire uh, you know probably like three different short stories within mm-hmm. the H1 universe. So, yeah. and I I wasn't familiar with that, so I'm I'm glad to hear that information but i do like carla speed mcneil she's one of the mm-hmm. writers on that and yeah. i liked her uh was it finder that series that mm-hmm. sci-fi series she did yeah and i was really taken with that so i'm kind of i'm glad to see her involved with it that's a that's a good that's a good name mm. for me yeah, yeah. no it's a it's a pretty solid lineup i know john cassidy is like the creative director or something like that i'm probably getting his name wrong i'm probably getting his title wrong but then you have mark way kind of playing an editor-in-chief role mm-hmm. and uh on top of that yeah you got guys like yannick pa- yannick paquette and carl speed mcneil and like yeah it's it's just a it's going to be impressive whatever it is so it's like an all-star team <laughs> Mm-hmm. What is also impressive is the fact that over the past several years, Humanoids has really done a lot to branch out because mm. it wasn't that long ago that, at least for me, whenever I thought of Humanoids or saw a reference to Humanoids, I immediately thought of the kind of things that we usually get from Mobius and Jodorowsky, yeah. you know, either individually or together, right? So what you would consider maybe classic, more times than not, sci-fi-ish or fantasy Graphic albums from Franco-Belgian primarily creators. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. they they did other things as well, working in other genres, but that's what I would usually think of. But I know that two or three years ago, they started a Younger Reader initiative where they were coming out with titles for Young Readers. And then earlier this year, they started their Life Drawn series, which are more Mm -hmm. realistic narratives. And so Mm -hmm. I really appreciate the fact that Humanoids is doing different things and expanding its potential reach. Yeah, I think it's actually a doubly cool because I feel like because it's humanoids, the presentation, just mm. like the the actual physical yeah. presentation <clears throat> of these books are going to look really great. Like I have a copy of uh, I think it's Jodorowsky's Son of the Gun, and like it's beautiful, <laughs> like you know, yeah. and it's from humanoids. So like, yeah, I'm I'm very curious about the H1 line. I like I, I want to see what happens here. Yeah. yeah, and I agree with you. They have really slick pr- paper and really g- excellent production. I, mm-hmm. I've, I've really been happy with all their – because they're kind of like that kind of European volume yeah. feel to it. And mm-hmm. they, they put a lot of you know into the, actually just the object, which yeah. I, I really appreciate. 
They do. And another thing with their more recent initiatives is they're also more cost conscious because mm-hmm. a lot of these texts that we're describing, right, the, the nice binding, hardbound, oversized, even with like a ribbon bookmark, can be rather pricey. I think the last mm-hmm. pricey-ish book that I got from Humanoids was Moonface. And mm-hmm. a beautiful book, but it it, it was costly, e- even with a discount. Yes. So it, it's nice that they're coming out with more affordable, more times than not, paperback editions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm very, very, very curious. Okay. Anything else that either of you may want to say about the free comic book day offerings for 2019, or you want to move on to the image section? I will tell you, I have one more on page 40. It's the, okay. the sheets talking about young readers comics. Um, that sheets, a sheet story by mm-hmm. Lion Forge. Um, that was, I, I haven't read the sheets series proper, but I've heard really good things about it. So I'm, I'm glad that they're in here and they're one of those publishers that I think is kind of carving a bigger space in the comics world, especially when we get later in the catalog, I was kind of impressed by the, the, the real estate that they had, kind mm-hmm. of in terms of they're just putting out more and more material and uh, I've been excited by some other titles. So yeah. I, I do like that one too, a sheet story that looks really exciting to me. Yeah. I'm glad that you pointed that out because I completely overlooked that out, out of, um, I guess you could call it negligence or laziness because I saw that and I just assumed without reading the solicit that, oh, what they're doing is taking a selection from mm-hmm. that previously published book sheets and doing it, and I thought, eh, you know, that that's not my bag. And I know p- mm. different publishers use free comic book day issues for a variety of different reasons. I didn't mm. see that this was a new story. Now I'm more yeah. interested because a couple of months ago, Gwen and Crystal on the Young Readers show discussed Sheets. Right. And so this is an original story, a brand new one. Now I'm interested in checking this out. Mm-hmm. Exactly. They're 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 my they're my go to source lately, and so I was like, yeah, that sounds great, and I wish I had more time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, let's move on then to the image comic section, and I don't know about you guys, but I begin at the very beginning of Image on page fifty four, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and this is Darcy Van Polkest Geests and Ian Bertram's. Little Bird number one of Mm. five. It seems interesting, although I do have to admit, I'm usually one who bristles a bit when I see when I see a whole list of, you know, if you like such and such, or this is like this other title. And here we have it says, with the same limitless scope as a new East of West Mm. or saga and the drama and surrealism of Akira. (laughs) You know, I mean yeah. Although it, this is not as wild as some of them get. I mean, some of these kind of solicits I've seen in the past throw in completely disparate comics and genres. You know, if, yeah. if you like this crime noir, then you'll also like this fantasy title, this young reader's <laughs> title, this other's. And it's yeah. like, God, you know, just throw in the kitchen sink. But but this yeah. one, I mean, we have a short interview with the creators and then several pages of sample art. Mm-hmm. I'm going to check this out. Yeah, the yeah. sample really sold it for me. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed those pages, and uh, they're they're really intriguing. It's a great kind of entrance into this world. Well, we were talking earlier about uh, uh, European comics or uh, French comics, and this is definitely another French title. Like mm-hmm. this is being adapted by Image Comics for uh, English audiences. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like yeah. they're doing, or they have been doing, and they're currently doing with Unnatural. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. Which, uh, which I think proved to be enough of a hit to justify doing another one. So, yeah, I'm very curious about this. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. you know, Troy, I- I'm curious now. I-, I made a comment about the solicits, and every now and again, Sturge and I will mention something about the writing or the style and sometimes even the errors of the various solicits. I mean, I- <laughs> I've always been curious. Are, are the solicitations written by the publishers, and they're- they say, okay, use this? Absolutely, don't change anything. Or mm-hmm. do you guys at Diamond have the okay to tweak things here or there for brevity's sake? Um, no. Uh, so uh, pretty much the publishers uh, give us all the solicits, uh, and uh, we kind of work from that. Um, now, when it comes to our own programming, like we have a, we have, a, I gotta do a shout out. We we have a YouTube page, we have a YouTube page uh, that uh, that has a weekly show on it, and you know we kind of 
focus on we try to focus on what makes what interests us about that particular title and kind of like you know just get people like used to the idea of like understanding what this book is really about because like you said like sometimes the solicitations aren't perfect <laughs> like it's that uh, i totally support that i totally agree like there's an art to writing solicitation mm-hmm. but yeah okay yeah it's like a, it's like a movie trailer or something like that right exactly <laughs> and like yeah and like you said when you have too many things like yeah. it's being compared to it just gets lost mm-hmm. yeah or it's like a genre unto itself sometimes where it's right. like in a world where, right. no, you know, nothing makes sense. It's a sub, sub, sub genre. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, you know, also, I think also another thing I would always I would always tell people is like try to give us interior artwork because I think like we were talking about with little birds, like mm. it made it makes a huge difference to sometimes see the well, always to always see the interior artwork to really understand what type of story you're trying to tell. Um, and you don't really get that all the time with the catalog, of course, because some people are going to be limited to a uh, cover, but it is important. So I agree. And I think sometimes it's important. I mean, the the way that the uh, I'll do this. The next thing I looked at was on page 60 assassination, assassin nation. Yeah. Two mm-hmm. words, um, which is written by Kyle Starks and drawn by Erica Henderson, who are two uh, creators who I, I, I follow pretty much what they do. And Kyle Starks is one of those guys that um, I will read anything he writes. Uh, and we, I, I see him at cons and we talk and he knows who I am and I'm like a Patreon supporter. Mm. And he calls me an early adapter of his work. <laughs> um, but um, and Plus he's a really nice guy. Yeah, he's, and he's hilarious. He's all mm-hmm. these things. Um, but this series to me is super exciting. Um, the premise is basically that uh, there's a hitman who is – going to be somebody is going to try to assassinate him so he hires 20 of the greatest assassins in the world to be his bodyguards and they all have really ridiculous names but i like i like the preview and the write-up but the 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 preview art is mostly like splash pages and like you know people's names with their uh, people's pictures with their names under it and i like it because it kind of gives me a flavor of it but i wish that there was more kind of the sequential art parts to it so i could see more about more how it story work. yeah yeah so that was one of the and i mean in the interview afterward helps a lot too but this yeah. i would buy this regardless just because of their names and mm-hmm. i'm glad to see some things but i didn't think it was quite as effective as like the little bird preview which i i was more like eh, i might look at this and then i saw the preview and i was like i'm buying this mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah, I'm very curious. This is another cool one, like uh, Erica Henderson branching out from Score Girl and doing a uh, doing something creator owned. Uh, right. Yeah, it'd be it'd be interesting to see how their how differ her style differs from that book to this book. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, I like I like both of them, and actually we've had both Erica and Kyle on the podcast in the past, especially Kyle. We've had him on at least two times. Mm-hmm. I'm and I'm and I'm more of a fan of Kyle's work than I am of Erica Henderson's. However, for quite a while, Squirrel Girl has been on my to read list for a while. I, it's just a matter of time. I haven't gotten around to it yet, mm-hmm. but I know she gets a lot of attention and a lot of people are all a gaga. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I I like Squirrel Girl a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, right after that is on page 66 after the Starks Henderson interview Mm -hmm. is something that I don't know if I'm going to get. Oh, I I can pretty much tell you I'm not going to get this individual issue, Uh, but it does raise an issue that I wanted to express and maybe ask you guys your thoughts. I was a big fan of Lazarus when it started Mm -hmm. a few years ago. And, Mm -hmm. you know, well, first and foremost, I'm a big fan of Greg Rucka. I really like Michael Lark's work as well. And here we have – actually, it's not only page 66, but uh, on 69, we have Greg Rucka's Black Magic, the first book of Shadows hardcover edition. And Mm -hmm. I wanted to mention these because with both of these titles, I was – a dedicated reader at first, and then things began to slow down, and they lost me. Not that the story itself, either the narrative or the art, I thought got worse. It's just the frequency of release Mm -hmm. got in the way. And so I just quit reading it, and now I feel very behind. 
And I'm wondering if you guys have similar experiences with series in that when creators are late or when they seem to be juggling too many balls at the same time, do you tend to turn off? Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, I, I, I mean, it happens. I remember uh, when Fraction was putting out a uh, Hawkeye with uh, David Aha. Like uh, the book just kind of started to disappear, <laughs> mm-hmm. and so I just kind of forgot about it. And by the time I caught back up to it, uh, uh, I realized I was like five issues behind, and I had to gauge whether or not I really liked that book or not. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just one of those things. Like I realized, hey, I'll wait for trade. So yeah, it definitely happens, and it's really unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'll agree because Black Magic, that first book of Shadows hardcover, I I highlighted that too. But it's I, I had a similar experience. I I. I think I bought the first issue and then I bought the first trade, which came came out pretty soon afterward. Like it, that, I think the first five issues came out pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like you said, there was like a couple of years. It feels like since then, before the second series or the second volume, I guess, which is collected in this one. And yeah, I was really psyched about the first volume. And this is one of those series that you know I had, thought had a lot of promise, and then I just you know it, it's just it's there on my radar, but it's way on the periphery <laughs> like right, just because yeah. of you know other things have kind of come out and gotten my attention since then so yeah it happens to me too i mean there's lots of, i i've talked you know that mythical the, the four short boxes in my basement that i'm like i will get to these books one day <laughs> you know i mean every now and then you'll come across something that is like you forget about it and then it finally concludes or whatever and you're like oh wow i forgot how good this was mm-hmm. um but that that's you know that's kind of a real. That's a real gamble if you're a creator. So I'll just say that. Yeah, yeah. like Berlin this year with Jason Lutz's Berlin. It was one of those right. like, like, like I know this is phenomenal, but it's taken a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Yeah, but but you know, I, I think of what do I call maybe more alternative if you want to call them that creators. I, I think of them a little differently than I do mm-hmm. with. Uh, either mainstream or premier publishers as are categorized here in previews, it, 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 they're kind of different beasts. So if right. someone who is coming out with something, either individual issues or even collections from publishers like, you know, drawn in quarterly Fantagraphics, or right. even smaller ones, I'm okay. I, I'm more lapped to give them a pass, right? In other words, sure. Um, and this is going to be a name that I mention later in the show, but if I don't see anything for a long time from Bill Griffith, yeah, I don't hold it against him because I more or less expect him in terms of collections or new books to take a while. And mm-hmm. that's that's not the same kind of criteria that I give to people. Let's say like Greg Rucka, you know, it's probably not fair, but right. it's just a difference right. of expectations. You waited what thirty five year for thirty five years for Bill Griffith to give us a graphic novel, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that memoir his very first. Uh, yeah. But but hey, he gave us years and years and years of Zippy. So I love Zippy, <laughs> my, one of my favorites of all time. I will say uh, Mark Miller is two for two with me because he makes you wait for a book, but every time he every time he does, I feel like I actually get my money's worth, which is like very rare. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, most of them are like, uh, I don't know, you, you get it, and you're like, I waited this long for this. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Now, I mean, there are other things that I find of interest that I may get in the image section, but really nothing that I wanted to highlight on the show. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's not a number one of a brand new series right. other than the ones yeah. we already mentioned. And as for trades, you know, we usually don't mention those unless for some reason they really stand out. All right, mm-hmm. right. I will say that like uh, there are some really good books that are kind of coming to an end, mm-hmm. or, or are turning into ongoings. Like so, definitely check those out. Like I like kind of earmarked uh, Skyward by Joe Henderson, which is still mm-hmm. going on, mm-hmm. um, which was a, just like a fun like kind of sci-fi adventure story um, about a world a world of a world in zero gravity. I like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's a, just a fun book. Um, also, uh, if you for those who care about it, he is the showrunner of Lucifer, which I found out uh, mm. when I when I interviewed him. So, <laughs> wow. Uh, um, Cemetery Beach, Warren Ellis. I know a lot of people love Warren Ellis. I'm one of them, um, and he's doing a really cool little action book with uh, uh, the artist behind uh, Trees, Jason Howard. Mm-hmm. Um, also, Prodigy, which is Mark Miller, who I mentioned earlier. Um, I, if you're big on diversity in comics. 
here's a comic that has diversity in it, and it's actually really cool. Um, and uh, yeah, Sharky, also Mark Miller, and Murder Falcon, which is also just a really cool, uh, absurd heavy metal comic. <laughs> so yeah, you know, just cool stuff to just keep an eye out, keep mm-hmm. an eye on, because I know some people we don't always have the luxury of picking up number ones, but you know, sometimes it's okay to pick it up in the middle and kind of figure out where you're going. That's how we used to do it, right? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I know that one of the reasons why we usually on these preview shows try to limit ourselves to just discussing solicits for number one of a new series is because if we did otherwise, our shows would be like four hours long. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. My first one, I think I did that. I was like, oh, yeah, by the way, there's a book. This is the guy I haven't seen is working forever. (laughs) You are cordially invited to our gala New Year's Eve midnight show. Yes, sir, we're throwing a wonderful party to top all the good times you've ever had on New Year's Eve. So do either of you have anything else in the image? I don't. Okay. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, the rain down everything. Yeah, well, let's uh, let's move on to, to Dark Horse. And cool. I actually, just as I started at the beginning of Image... I have something at the very beginning of Dark Horse, and this is a new Burger book. Uh, I'm a fan of Burger books. About a year ago, not quite, we had Karen Burger on the podcast to talk about the launch of Burger books, and that was a wonderful conversation. She really is uh, great to have on the show and to talk with. But this one is on page 106. It's the first issue of G. Willow Wilson and Christian Ward's Invisible Kingdom. And this is another one where we have great sample art. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And I'm glad you highlighted this one too, because this is this is exactly where I went in the uh in the catalog myself. So yeah, the creator names are, are phenomenal. I've really enjoyed their past work. And like you said, those burger books have been great. I really like that interview. So if you haven't listened to that Karen Burger interview, I I I, I really liked listening to you talk to her because she's had a finger in a lot of pies mm-hmm. uh, over the years. And she's got a lot a lot of interesting things to say. Yeah. And this is this is a sci-fi story. Uh, and mm-hmm. it, it, the way they describe it is you have two women, a young religious acolyte and a hard bitten freighter pilot who separately uncover a vast conspiracy between the leader of the system's dominant religion and the mega corporation that controls society. So, you know, even though it's a sci-fi narrative, it's probably something that's very pertinent to, to today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is what sci-fi does well. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, no, I like, I just want to second that Karen Berger thing. Like, you know, she's a, she's a superstar editor. Like, mm-hmm. you know, she's been behind a lot of really great books. So, you know, this is a great line. If you're a fan of like vertigo from the nineties, early two thousands. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, she, she's that, she's that person. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. And I'm excited just cause it's, I think this is G Willow Wilson's first creator owned book. Um, mm-hmm. and I really like what she's done with Ms. Marvel at, uh, the, the Kamala Khan, Ms. Marvel at, at, at Marvel. And mm-hmm. uh, I haven't read the wonder Woman. I mean, but the wonder Woman's just coming out now from right. what I know. Um, but again, Christian Ward's art, I read Odyssey. Um, I wasn't, I'll tell you, I wasn't incredibly taken with the story, but the artwork is like knock your socks off crazy good. So I'm I'm excited to to see this and the preview pages, like Derek said, or you know, they was they sell this book. Mm. Yeah, and you know, getting back to the significance of Karen Berger, you know, we can see a few pages later on 109 that issue number two of Girl in the Bay, which we discussed last month, mm-hmm. and also issue number four of LaGuardia are also being solicited. And this is just really really good stuff. And you know, you're right, Troy. She knows what she's doing when it comes to editing and curating and bringing to light just incredible creators. Right now, I'm finishing up uh, the American comic book chronicles, the 1990s, because I'm about Mm. to interview Keith Dallas and Jason Sachs, the author of that volume. That's a great series, by the way. But because it deals with the 90s, they spend a lot of time talking about the founding of Vertigo. Mm-hmm. In 1993, yeah. and the significance of that, and in fact, they even I think at one point write that that is one of the most significant events in comics from the 1990s. Oh yeah, it's its own little, it's its own sort of golden age, like in itself. And I, you know, I, it it bugs me that people don't actually uh, talk. I guess maybe because we're too close to it still, but like mm-hmm. um, the people don't refer to it in that way. Like it really created that that era of Vertigo is like a Hydra. 
You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. like from there, like so many really cool things happen in comics at large. And it just so happens that right when I was about to get out of comics, this sucked me back in. So I have a, I'm very fond of that that era. Yeah, and then it's, and it's and I get it too because like the '90s, there's the whole you know the image thing and all like where the mm-hmm. artwork went kind of wonky and the superhero world definitely you know went off kilter in a lot of ways and yeah. Yeah, yeah. Marvel almost going bankrupt and all that yeah um but yeah like the, the there were definitely you know this this other movement that just started up and you know at that you know i think it's like you said it's 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 spawned the world that we live in today in, in, in comics yeah, yeah, yeah a yeah. lot of them anyway right? yeah, yeah well where do you guys go next in dark horse um i gonna i'm not sure if i'm skipping ahead here but there's a book called uh Bad Luck Chuck. Okay. That actually was really interesting. Uh, was anybody else picking that one? Yeah, I, I, I highlighted that. But before that, I wanted to make mm-hmm. maybe just a brief passing, kind of a drive-by, I guess, on page 110. And this is a, yet another title Black in Hammer. the Black Hammer world. And this is Black <laughs> Hammer 45 from the world of Black Hammer, number one. Uh, you know, I, I've said it before on this show, I really enjoy Black Hammer and I like the world that Lemire is creating. I just feel at this point I've gotten behind and I'm overwhelmed. That's why I'm waiting for these nice Dark Horse Library editions to come out mm-hmm. so I can read it all at one point. Because at this point, I've just stopped getting the individual issues. There's just so many. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, the guy's crazy yeah. prolific. Um <laughs> And I'm excited about this one. I, I highlighted this one. I mean, it's the top of the solicit page is like Jeff Lemire, Matt Kent, Ray Fox. It's like all you need to know. Buy this book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Lemire's like he's like prolific, doesn't even begin to describe that guy. Like there's some writers. I'm just like, how do you put out so much stuff? Like him, Colin Bunn, um, actually Donnie Cates. Like I'm just it's mind it's mind blowing. But yeah, super prolific. So so then you go to page 125, Troy, right, with Bad Luck Chuck, number one? Yeah. Bad Luck Chuck uh, is about this woman who has, like, a, just a really bad luck. And she's gotten to the point where she's kind of farming it out for profit. So if you want to, <laughs> you know, if you want to, uh, if you want that insurance claim on your house, like, she'll just kind of be there, you know? Uh, and then, of course, this backfires on her, and that's, like, where this plot, where the story is going forward. But I just thought it was kind of a neat concept, and uh, sounds like a lot of fun, so. I agree, and, and I'm not familiar with the art of Matthew Dow Smith, but it looks really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, his, I've seen his work on other stuff before, and I, I'm blanking on what it is. But, yeah, he's got a really kinetic style. I like him. Yeah, and it has a kind of a noirish look to it. Yeah, mm-hmm. Reminds me yeah. of just a tad, at least from a distance, of Sean Phillips. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and I like that too. I, I that was one of the series that I, I, I definitely, you know, I go through the whole previews, and you know, sometimes I, I will say, I, Derek used the word negligent. I feel like that. Like I look at, it, I'm like, nah, not for me, and I just, you know, just flip. But that was one of the ones that I looked at a couple times. That looks mm-hmm. really interesting. Yeah. Now, on that next page, 126, there's something that I'm not going to get, but I wanted to highlight for a particular reason. This is Matt Kent's Department mm. H, Omnibus Volume 1. I find it mm. interesting what Kent has been doing, especially through Dark Horse, with his series in that, you know, you have the individual issues in – with most of his series, especially the ones that he does for Dark Horse, he'll include something unique in the individual issues that won't be available in collections. So I appreciate right. that. Then the first collections that he comes out with are hardbound, and I like that. But then what he's done c- kind of recently, first with Mind Management and now with uh, apparently Department H, is to come out with these larger omnibus editions, but they're in paperback. So they're still affordable. So in other words, it's not necessarily the case that he's asking his readers to double dip, right? Because if you already have the hardbound collections of Department H or Mind Management, then why would you get a soft cover omnibus edition? But for those who may not have those hardbound initial collections, now you have the affordable omnibus. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, the it's like the Matt Kent library, all these little hardcovers and Omnibuy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, he's got a special little place in my, my, my collection that way too. Like I, I really appreciate those books. I highlighted this one too, is I haven't read, I'm just trade waiting on these things and I'm waiting, I think for this, this version. Where do you <laughs> like go next? H. 
Uh, I went to the next page, actually, on 127 to uh, Calamity Kate number one. Oh, okay. Which sounded interesting. It's uh, written by uh, Magdalene Visaggio. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really enjoy her writing. Um, and this just sounds like a, an interesting kind of concept. It's a... Uh, I mean, I'll read you the first sentence of the, the, the solicit. It says, Kate Strand reboots her destructive life and moves to L.A. to be the superhero she always wanted to be. Calamity Kate, gun-toting monster killer. And this seems like an alternate kind of world where, you know, she's just this badass with spikes on her leather jacket. And she's got a sword. And there's it's like California full of uh, zombies, vampires, demons, goblins. And she's out there just, just fighting things. So... Uh, I don't like it, you know, sometimes I like a good action, don't think about it too much book, and this seems like that for me. And I don't mean that in a damning way. Like, sometimes I, I just want that, <laughs> like a Mad Max type thing, and this seems like that kind of thing to me. Yeah, this does look interesting. I didn't mark it to, to mention, if for no other reason, because I felt like I already had too much that I <laughs> wanted to, to mention on this show. And I, I do like Fasangio's work. Uh, I've had her. I've talked with her a couple of times, in fact, for the Comics Alternative once at Heroes Con two or three years ago when I first met her. And this is like right when Kim and Kim uh, first started. I think they were on uh, issue two of the new series. And then I had her on, I think it was maybe earlier this year or late last year. This is when Eternity Girl came, came out, right, right. Eternity Girl number one. And I spoke with both her and Sunny Lou separately. Uh, mm -hmm. Couldn't arrange something at the same time, but yeah, she does really good work. Yeah, I listen to that one too. Mm. I listen to a lot of them. See, <laughs> I go next to page one thirty. Okay, what's on one thirty? But actually, both of the things I oh, I yeah. think are worth mentioning. One is a new edition of the Horror of Collier County by Rich Tommaso. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see that this is coming back, and we've been seeing more of this. I think maybe at Image, but now we have here at Dark Horse uh, re-releasing some of his older material, which I think is good. Mm -hmm. But something that I'm even more appreciative of is Moonshadow, the definitive edition. This is a hardcover collection. I, I won't get it because I have the collected Moonshadow, but this is a nice hardbound edition that seems at an affordable price at retail twenty nine ninety nine, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to have some additional material. Like concept art, right? And, right? and also there's going to be a new introduction by uh, Dematius. Is it Dematius or Dematias? I've heard both. I love his work, though. I say both. <laughs> How's that? Just to cover my bases. I only have one other thing in the Dark Horse section on page 138. Uh, do you guys have anything before that? I have something on the next page uh, the, on 131 just because it's uh, – it's, there are a couple art books in this this. Uh, edition of previews and this is one of the ones uh it's james stoko um, oh yes uh -huh. it's called grunt the art and unpublished comics of james stoko and i mean i love just looking at his his artwork like oh, the orc sure. stain and his godzilla books i've really enjoyed so you know i'm not the biggest like i don't usually buy art books but there's some comics in this so this is definitely one that caught my eye yeah, no, he's a he's a different he's a definite favorite of mine. Like it, he's like kind of a little bit of Art Adams and a little mm -hmm. bit of like the the um, Jeff Darrow. It's like yeah, it's just really cool. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was I actually said the exact same thing to a coworker the other day. I was like, I'm buying this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Can I justify it? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but, I'm <buying> right. <laughs> but I'm buying it. Don't care. Yeah. <laughs> it does look um, good. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I like was I noticed. Uh, well, I shouldn't say the only other thing I noticed, but uh, did we pass Astro Hustle just yet? Oh no, that was that was a little bit back. I saw that one too. Okay, I think it was like one twenty six. Right, like I the 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 premise is a little muddy. Um, I will openly say that, but like uh, I it just it looks cool. Like I like the design of it, and it's a little it's a bit eye catching. It looks like they're doing like an eighties hero type thing, and I'm totally into that. So. Yeah, definitely Astro Hustle from Dark Horse Comics. Did you say what page is that on? It was on 116. I'm sorry, I said 126, but I was one number off. Okay. Yeah, this, yeah it looks very ah. Flash Gordon. Very Flash mm -hmm. Gordon-y. So. In very 70s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With the mm -hmm. colors and whatnot, yeah. yeah. It's like the, the, president's, the president of the galaxy's criminal brother is going to come and mess things up for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and apparently his brother's a, a space pirate, so who, everybody loves space pirates, so let's just do it. 
<laughs> so on <laughs> page 138, and this is the last thing I have in Dark Horse, is something I'm really excited about. And this is Eminon, Volume 1, Memories mm-hmm. of Eminon. And this is by Shinji Keijo and Kenji Tsutura. And the thing that excites me about this title is that the artist, Kenji Tsutura, is also the creator behind Wondering Island, which I really enjoyed. And in fact, the next volume of Wondering Island should be coming out really soon. And now we have this new work. Hmm. Yeah, this one caught my eye, too. The cover is gorgeous. Yeah. And I really enjoyed the description. So I think I'm not familiar with uh, I haven't read Wandering Island. So but I've heard good things about that from well, from the reviews and uh, just in general. So this is something I'd, I'd want to check out, too. Yeah. Now, since we're talking about manga for the first time on this episode, I'm going to ask you, Troy, mm-hmm. when you guys decided with the previews catalog to make the changes that you did several months ago, yeah. I know one of the big ones was as best as you could. I mean, with publishers like, let's say, Drawn and Quarterly or Fanagraphics or here at Dark Horse, mm-hmm. um, yeah, some man- manga titles are included in the main section, but for the most part, all the manga is toward the back. Have yeah. you heard much reaction, either positive or negative, about those changes, or that one in particular? And, and not so much from individual readers, but retailers. Um, I, you know, I haven't experienced much feedback, uh, but I personally think it was a good move. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the emphasis on uh, premier publishers that we have. And um, I think that having I – mean, you know, there was a time when there wasn't even a manga section. So to be able to have a manga section that's like categorized in a way that's just as digestible as the rest of the catalog I think is really, really useful. So Okay. And the reason I'm asking – I agree. I think it's good to have a lot of the manga all together. And I think mm-hmm. it makes it easier not just for individuals like us but also for retailers because if they know that they have a clientele that has a – um, a, a big uh, appreciation of manga, then you know they know where to go for that. The one potential drawback is that some publishers like Dark Horse and Drawn and Quarterly are going to have manga titles in the main section, so mm-hmm. it, it's not completely balanced. But you know, right, right. It's, it's I think it's kind of a minor thing. Right, right. No, for sure. Like, I mean, I'm, that was definitely a conversation that was had. But you know, Dark Horse is a very particular line, and they've been honestly doing manga. Uh, probably even longer than some of the uh, recent yeah. crop of companies out there. So, you know, they, they get a little bit of prestige. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. They've been doing things since they, since the eighties. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember, I remember doing anything. I remember being a kid and picking up gunsmith cats and being like, what is this? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. You know? So, and it was a dark horse title at the time. So, or a dark, imported by dark horse. Mm-hmm. Well, if we don't have anything else in dark horse, the next section uh, well, it, at least truncated section is DC, but mm-hmm. we go to the DC catalog, which is separate now. Speaking of changes mm-hmm. to previews, yep. And and what do you guys have in the DC catalog? Uh, I have one title in there. It's on page twelve, and I don't know. You said you had one too, and I don't know if it's the same one. Well, I do have the same one. I think that you're referring to on page twelve, but I have something before that. And okay. This is it. on page eight, and I think Troy, you wanted to say something about this as well. And this is Dial H for Hero number one, Sam yeah, Humphreys yeah, yeah. and Joe Canonis. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, it is the cover of this month's the, it's the front cover of this month's previews, um, and uh, yeah, I just think that this is very interesting what they're doing with this Wonder Comics line. This is uh, curated by Brian Michael Bendis, and he's basically bringing in some of uh, the the top talent that was. Uh, very much circulating him during his time at Marvel or coming over to DC uh, to work on these young reader focused titles. And I think that putting Dow H for hero at the forefront of that, at least for this month is probably one of the coolest things um, uh, DC has done in their kids line in a while. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm more excited about this than I am the young justice book actually. (laughs) So Yeah. And and the reason why I wanted to mention this and, you know, listeners of the show know that with our previews episodes, we usually don't highlight anything that has something to do with the DC or Marvel universes. Not that 
we don't like that. We do. It's just that we leave that to other comics podcasters and 99.9% yeah. of them. That's what they look at almost exclusively. And that's yeah. fine. We, we just have a different focus, but I wanted to uh-huh. mention this because I'm curious to see, I want to, I want to read this and see what it's about. And so this is going to be kind of a different take on dial H for hero than we've seen in the past. But uh-huh. I wanted to bring this up because the last time, this is a few years ago, that we got a mini series of Dial H for Hero, if you remember. Huh. It it was part of the main DC line. However, it read like a Vertigo title. And one of the things yeah. I never could figure out is why didn't they just go ahead and make this a Vertigo title and yeah. not feel the need to shove it into the DC universe? Which mm-hmm. is, is one of the problems that I have with not only DC but also Marvel. When they come out with something new, it it's almost as if it has to be part of the larger universe. Mm. Um, and now with DC especially, I mean, you have the out, so to speak, of Vertigo. And then, of course, now we have the Jinx world. But – and, of course, the Sandman universe, which for all practical purposes is Vertigo. Mm. But I mean, it is published through Vertigo. But – you don't see anything that's not one of those imprints published by DC that isn't part of their universe. And I think that Dial H for Hero should stand alone or as wacky as the title has been historically should be Vertigo. Mm. Yeah. I mean, they definitely, I mean, you mentioned this earlier, but they definitely tried a Vertigo line. I, I want to say Brian K. Vaughn wrote the Vertigo book, but like, I, I can't remember who it was. Um, but yeah, the book has gone gone through so many different lines mm-hmm. i i personally feel like having these separations kind of makes it easier for companies to manage like you know their particular particular lines but also particular audiences um and so i'm always happy to see uh major publishers putting some real giving uh, a kid's line some real push because you know, I you know I've been reading Spider Man since like the '90s. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to translate to a younger reader. But I also want my Spider Man. You know, <laughs> so right. um, so you know it's uh, you know it's slightly selfish, but also it's because you know a new generation should be able to experience these things. So, mm-hmm. and I think I mean I've I'm interested in this title too. Um, I didn't highlight. Well, I had it and then I erased it because I was like, we have a lot to talk about. Um, but I've read pretty much every Dial H uh, series. And I remember that, what, the 2012 series, which mm. felt like a Vertigo book. And I think it just kind of got swept up in the – I think it came out as part of the New 52. So maybe mm. you know DC was like, no, there, there's no Vertigo anymore. Everything is – and Vertigo seemed to be in a weird place yeah. where they were publishing a lot of like noir – they had that that they had like they seem to be trying to do more like little self-contained books mm-hmm. than they did. Uh, and I say little like they were smaller size, like more like novelistic or you know mm-hmm. like a typical paperback, but they were hardcover. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Um, and I liked that series. And then I read because uh, it was more like a vertigo book and it had a I forget who the, the writer was, but the writer was uh, was like uh, a real per like a real person listening. <laughs> It was uh, China Melville, uh, who does who I think is a novelist and not so much a graphic novelist. Hmm. Um, but then there was that the Hero series, which is just H E R O. It was written by Will Pfeiffer, and that was I enjoyed that one too. And it, it kind of did some weird gender things, I think, because it, it did things to people. Like there were some men and some women that had the dial, and it it it, it kind of changed them around. And it was more vertigo-y, but it was still part of the DC universe. And so, yeah, to me, it's interesting that this is uh, aimed at, at, you know, like younger readers, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the creators involved are, are definitely intriguing. Um, yeah. yeah. I, you know, and I, I definitely do want to check this out. It, it sounds – and it's six issues. So even if it's not awesome, which it seems like it'll be at least, you know, mm-hmm. a good read. Um, you know, I, I and it's got a lot of concept. You know, it's got a lot of uh, – I think it's got a lot of potential to me. Yeah, it's like, yeah. uh, if you think of something like Ben 10 with the kids, it's like yeah. a guy who can become lots of different other guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is that kind of series that, you know, and it seems like they're going definitely of, uh, I don't know. They look more multicultural than in the past. You know, he's not Robbie Reed. It's not the, like the blonde kid with the freckles. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, they, they seem to be, you know, trying to broaden their audience. And that's mm-hmm. one of those things. I forget who I was reading, but, they were talking about 
I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago that the, the big problem with the comics companies is that they didn't go for the kid audiences. They doubled down on like, we're going to do really mature, grim and gritty comics instead of uh-huh. like trying to hook kids. Uh-huh. Um, Cause you know, you get you, the other people were fans. And now it's like, if you get the kids, the kids, you know, longer, longer lives yeah. in general, they, 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 uh-huh. you know, more buying over the long term. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm in, I'm heartened that there's you know good comics coming out. It looks like aimed at younger readers. Yeah, yeah, same here. And like uh, you know, I think the fact that it is Sam Humphries means that I means that I'll be able to re- read it without rolling my eyes. Mm-hmm. So I mean, like, and Sam Humphries did that Mighty Thor book that I absolutely loved a few years ago. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, like if it's anything like that, I'm I'm on board 100. Mm-hmm. percent Now, Sturge, you say you go to page 12. I went to page 12, which is a Vertigo book. Right. Uh, Speaking of Vertigo. That's it. Written mm. by Mark Russell, and it's a comic called Second Coming, um, which sounds interesting. It's huh. basically Jesus comes back, um, <laughs> and he becomes roommates with Sun Man, who's basically Superman. So <laughs> Jesus and Superman are roommates trying to figure out how to deal with the problems of the world. I mean, how do you not read that book? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Sun Man is uh, the last son of the planet Crispix. That's right. Just add milk. <laughs> yes. I was just about to say, yeah. So it sounds fun. I mean, it, yeah. you know, it sounds like, you know, the to me, that's one of the things I think in general. This seems like it's going to have a sense of humor to it. And I, I kind of welcome that because I read a lot of comics and there's a lot that are serious. Um, but this, mm-hmm. you know, I don't think, I think the humor, the humor parts are not as highlighted anymore. Mm-hmm. All right. And, you know, this is one of those books that seems interesting to me. And I also noticed in the DC section, and I wasn't cognizant of this before, but Mad Magazine is in there now. And I don't oh, remember yeah. if that was in the past volumes, too. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. Has been. No, they've yeah. always been. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just haven't noticed it. But, mm-hmm. you know, I was glad that there's those kinds of works being more, you know, getting highlighted here. Yeah. 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 Now, now you, um, uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Troy. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to like at least talk a little bit about Detective Comics 1000, um, which is a very big deal. Um, it uh, comes on the heels of Superman's 80th anniversary, where Action Comics also turned 1000. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, like the Detective Comics 1000 is celebrating 80 years of Batman because those are another comic history. Those two characters came right behind each other one year apart. So uh, yeah, so this is a big milestone. And not just for DC, but for comics in general. Like, it's kind of a big deal. And I, I see people keep saying that uh, uh, this is the first superhero book to – ongoing superhero book to hit 1,000. But just in general, the fact that the book is at 1,000 is pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. So, and just proof that these are modern mythologies and they continue to endure. So, Yeah, I dig them. I like all the covers personally. That's, mm-hmm. that's the thing I, I, I like out of those. Yeah. Um, that Steve Rude one's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'm also just looking forward to some stories from uh, uh, Kevin Smith and Warren Ellis, and I know Jim Lee's got to do a piece in there and a couple other things, so I'm I'm all for it. Very interested. Cool. Well, the only other thing that I have in the DC catalog is actually something that Sturge briefly oh, referred I know what to you're earlier, do. and that mm-hmm. was on page 41 with Mad. Mad Magazine, Mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, they were numbered, uh, so Mad (laughs) number seven. But I wanted to mention this one because inside of Mad Magazine number seven is a facsimile edition of Plop number one (laughs) from 1973. And the 70s is when, as a kid, I really started to read comics. Mm -hmm. And one of the titles that I have a very big fondness for is plop because i was i was getting plop i think i got almost all of the the entire run of plop and then a number of years ago after i left undergraduate school and i needed money like an idiot i sold all my comics that i had which i know a lot of listeners probably say yeah i've done the same so quit complaining but (laughs) one of the series that i went back to rebuy later in life plop Oh, yeah. So I have all the issues of Plop now, and so I'm not going to get this issue of Mad, but I'm mentioning it because uh, how much I love Plop. I think that people who aren't familiar with what Plop is would do well to get Mad Magazine number seven. Yeah, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, I remember in an issue of back issue, not that long, well, in the last year, uh, Bob Rizakis 
Yeah. I have to talk about Greek people that make comics um, <laughs> or deal with comics. But he, he used to drive the – they had a bus. They had like a comics bus. that They would go out to the suburbs and give away comics. And Plop was by far the most requested title. That's what he said. <laughs> like everyone wanted Plop. And then after that, it was – I think Superman was popular then, mm. more popular than Batman. But yeah, Plop, Plop. I mean it's got great art. It's got uh, – oh, what's his name? Basil Wolverton right, is in there. Sergio Argonis the is in yeah. there. Oh, nice. Yeah, there's some gorgeous artwork in in, in, in Plop. So, and this is this is I'm assuming with Argonis attached to this. This is some sort of satirical magazine. I'm not familiar with this one. I've heard of it before, but like mm-hmm. I've never. I don't think I've ever actually like seen what Plop is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's a humor magazine with mm-hmm. a twist to it. And you know how in the 1970s. Whether you read them originally or not, I mean, you probably know this, that Mm. DC had a line of horror comics like House of Mm -hmm. Secrets, House of Mystery, so on and so forth. And for most of them, they had these kind of creepy hosts, Abel, Cain, and then Eve. That's right. And Mm. so in Plop, what you have are Aragones drawn Cain, Abel, and Eve, but they aren't introducing stories with a horror twist. I mean, there is some kind of horror in some of the plop narratives, but mm. it's kind of like funny Twilight Zone type of stuff. Okay. Uh, and it, it sometimes the stories are very short. I mean, sometimes they're just gag strips uh, that yeah. are sprinkled mm. throughout plop. But it's got a great sense of humor, especially for younger readers, and, and mm-hmm. I was at the time. But, you know, hey, I appreciate them as, as an older reader as well. And, and like you know, Sturge was saying, not only do you have covers by Basil Wolverton, but you also have mm-hmm. interior art by Aragonez, Bernie mm-hmm. Wrightson, and, and a lot of others. And so it really is a smorgasbord of humor goodness. Oh, awesome. I like it. I love, I love a little comic history there. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Plop. That's fun to say. Yeah. <laughs> also, it's just fun to say. Yeah. There's a new little guy who's coming your way. He's the new year. Yes, sir. Okay, is that – are we done with the DC catalog? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay, mm-hmm. so then we come to IDW, and where do you guys begin in the IDW section, if at all? Um, well, the first thing – I actually think it's the first uh, It's the first page in the IDW section um, is Glow, number one. Ah, uh, okay. I'm there, too. That's not – actually, that's mm-hmm. on page 151, so it's not the first because you know there's a series of uh, okay. licensed property stuff. But yeah, I Correct. highlighted that, too. So why, did, mm-hmm. uh, why are you interested in Glow? You know, so uh, I was a big wrestling fan growing up, mm-hmm. and I actually remember Glow, the TV show. Oh yeah. And um, but then on top of that, it turns out that the Netflix show is actually really, really, really good. Mm-hmm. And I'm so I'm just very curious how that translates to uh, to a, a you know 22 pages of, of comic story. So yeah, it just it just got my attention for sure. There's so many ways they could go with this, <laughs> and uh, it could be a straight on like you know drama like the TV show, or it could be something entirely different, which would also be cool. So yeah, just as a fan of these characters, I'm on board. Yeah, and I like the. I mean, I watched the the first two seasons of the series, and mm-hmm. I'm really into it too. And yeah, yeah. it's to me the, the the I'm not gonna call them caricatures, but the you know how the the, the various characters have been drawn on the cover is really eye catching and interesting mm-hmm. to me too. Yeah. So, well, no, you know, I've, cool. I've seen the first episode of the Netflix series, and the reason why I watched it was not so much a love of wrestling, but I really do like the humor of Mark Mirren, who stars mm-hmm. on that Netflix series. Yeah. And so that's why I wanted to point this out. But curiously enough, on the cover, I do not see a Mark Mirren type character. No, but I'm sure he pops up somewhere in the book for sure. Yeah, he's in the he's in the plot. Or it, it could right. be. Although, I mean, I'm I'm wondering because they would have to get his sign off in order to be included in the comic, and I'm wondering if he's not on the cover. Maybe he just said thanks, but no thanks. I don't want to be a part of it. Do it with the the other people. I I don't know. I have no way of knowing. I don't know any backstory here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, they mentioned his name, uh, the name of his character, and uh, you know, Sam. Sam ruins the promise of a wrestling-free weekend with more wrestling. So <laughs> he's in the book somewhere, but right. he's not. The, he's not the cover. You don't. You 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 are pleasantly surprised by his antics and humor. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. uh, after and tight that, pants. Yeah. 
<laughs> Sorry. After that, where do you go? I might not have anything in the IDW because there weren't a whole lot of number ones for me. Um, there were a lot of collections, but there were a lot of licensed things that I just that 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 weren't my thing. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, got, I will. I will oh, go sorry. ahead. I just wanted to also point out that well, you mentioned a lot of number ones. They are rebooting Transformers, um, and uh, that's on the heels of a major event, and uh, might be something worth checking out because I think they're going to kind of rejigger the Transformers mythology for those of you who are fans of the Transformers line. Mm -hmm. So something to keep an eye out for. And the editor in chief at this point is actually a huge Transformers uh, guy. He was a former writer, and now he's the editor in chief of IDW. So. Yeah. Yeah, some cool things might be going on over there. And I and I misspoke. I start on page one seventy two. I, oh, mm -hmm. I didn't. And and I did a little little research. And uh, you say his name, Dematis. Dematis <laughs> Dematias. Right. I, I don't know how you pronounce oh, it, but there was a there's a there's a thanks to Google. There is actually a like a Stam soapbox or one of those little Marvel, you know, the little little yellow box that used to be in the seventies and eighties. But it's got a pronunciation guide to often mispronounced <laughs> creators, and his is on there, and it says Dematis. Dematis. Okay. Dematis. There you go. Okay. And, and Ralph Macchio is not Macchio, but Macchio. Huh. And for, for you Marvel historians. <laughs> um, but on uh, page one – no, not one. 172? On page, oh, 172. There's a comic there uh, called Impossible Inc. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. written by Dematis and drawn by Mark Mike Cavallero. Who I've read some of his other things, um, and it's kind of a sci-fi adventure story um, aimed at middle school readers. Um, but she's uh, she's on a cosmic train called the Non-Local Express, riding across the Quantum Sea, and she's looking for her father. So it sounds kind of like a weird kind of uh, Doctor Who with a young person on a train mm. kind of story, and that sounds interesting to me. I'm actually glad you pointed that one out because I, I actually am sitting on issue number one and I picked it up because it was a uh, jam Dematis <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, like I, you know, this is another one of those guys who I grew up reading in the nineties mm -hmm. and he's always consistently delivered up and even up till today. So yeah, I'm just very curious what this, what this book was about. So I need to check it out, but it looks cool. It looks fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm glad you pointed that out because I overlooked it, unfortunately. I guess because right underneath was Atomic Robo, and I, I always liked oh, Atomic yeah. Robo. <laughs> so I didn't pay attention to Impossible Incorporated. And, and I should have, given Dematis's name being listed there as the writer. But on the topic of younger readers, if you go to the next page, there are a couple of titles there that I think would be worth checking out, especially mm -hmm. if you're listening to this, Gwen and or Crystal, something to consider <laughs> for the Young Reader Show. I don't know if Gwen listens to this, uh, but we, we give her tons of fodder for the Young Reader Show every single month. Um, but no, these two titles look really interesting. The first one is written by Serena Blasco and Nancy Springer with art by Blasco. And this is Enola Holmes, The Case of the Left-Handed Lady. And so apparently this is the sister, uh, the younger sister of Sherlock and Mycroft Holmes. Mm -hmm. And so it, it looks really fun, and the art looks eye-catching. And then right below that is the second volume of Violet Around the World, and this volume is called A New World Symphony. I remember a number of months ago when the first volume of Violet Around the World came out, uh, and this is something that I, I don't think that the Gwen or Crystal have discussed on the Young Reader Show. But again, it seems to be right up their alley. Looks yeah, nice. It's wonderful art. Yeah, I like that art in that too. By that Teresa was... Radis, written by Teresa Radis with art by Stefano Turconi. Mm -hmm. So it may be something in translation. I'm not sure. It's wild how that works. But yeah, like there's just I'm glad that we're seeing more and more European stuff being yeah translated, translated and published uh, over here. Just because, like yeah. you said, you know, there's so much out there that I had no awareness of that. Um, I'm just glad to see. And by publishers other than Humanoids, Cinebook, in other words, right. the people who usually do those kind of translations. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I only have one other thing in the IDW section, and this is on page 176. Uh, or 179. No, 176. I'm sorry. One's, actually, I have two things. Yeah. I, I was – okay. <laughs> on 176 is – this is a top shelf release – Highwayman, mm -hmm. and this is written and drawn oh, by yeah. Corinne Shadmi. I mm -hmm. had Corinne on when his Love Addict came out, 
And mm-hmm. it was a really fun interview. And I like Love Addict. I like the Abaddon. Uh, he does good work, both in terms of story and art. So this looks interesting. Mm-hmm. It says, a high woman travels through the vastness of North America searching for the source of his condition. He suffers from a strange, seemingly incurable disease in mortality. That is an eye-catching cover, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. I, I, I like the concept. That's an interesting concept. <clears throat> um, so I hadn't I, – I went over it. Um, I did not pay attention to this one. So mm-hmm. this is – I'm glad you highlighted it because mm-hmm. now – Keep adding to our to my reading list, Eric. <laughs> That's why I'm here, my friend. <laughs> That's it. And the last thing I have in IDW is on page – actually is on page 179. Mm-hmm. And this is, I think, the only Yo! Books release for this month, or at least this listed in the catalog. And this is not mm-hmm. really about comics. Just yesterday as we're recording this, I had the pleasure of having Craig Yo! back on the show for our annual – Happy New Yo show, which mm-hmm. by the time this preview show goes up, will have gone on our feed. So it, it's it's kind of a weird time thing going on, you know. So if you're listening to this right now, dear listener, then go back to the previous day's episode and check out if you haven't already my interview, which unfortunately Sturge, Sturge couldn't make. Um, That's sadness. Yeah, <laughs> sadness uh, with with Craig Yo. But he 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 talks about this because this is going to be coming out in May. From IDW and Yo Books, and it is Matchless Beauties: The Art of Pinup Matchbook Matchbook Covers. Oh yeah, by mm-hmm. by Richard Green, and he he was talking about this because he says he wants to do Craig wants to do more pop culture stuff, not just comics, and so mm-hmm. books that deal with pop culture in some way or another is what he wants to focus on in the future. And this is one of those projects. And he says the book opens up like a matchbook. So in other words, you open it up by pulling it up. (laughs) So it should be interesting. And Hmm. he and Kletzia, who who works with him on Yo! Books, always do an incredible job at design. So I'm looking forward to seeing what this looks like. Yeah, that's actually really cool. I like I I glossed over that, but that's actually a really interesting setup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw the Yo Books label and I looked at that and I was like, sold. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do either of you have anything else in IDW? I do not. Nope. Okay. After that is Dynamite and you know, I have nothing in Dynamite this month. I don't either, I don't think. Um no. I, well, what page did it end on? Did it end? That is. The thing. I have something on two sixteen. Oh, I, I heard a lonesome train in the background. Oh, that's me. Yeah. No, two sixteen <laughs> is the Boom Studio section, and I. I All right. Then. Yeah. I moved I, to Boom. I, I go there as well. So you want to talk about this one? Sure. On two sixteen is what? Oh, actually, I'm, I misspoke. Two fourteen. Okay. And Troy might actually be excited about this too, because this is another uh, book about Firefly adaptation yeah, it's called yeah. bad company number one yeah and it's uh, about saffron who is uh what mall's ex he is his wife his ex-wife right yeah, yeah. i don't know if they're ex <laughs> i don't remember but she's an interesting <laughs> character um so i'm kind of interested to see more about her backstory um so if you're a firefly flan that's easy for me to say right a flyer fly flan <laughs> um if you're a caramel made in spain and you like firefly um, no, if you're a Firefly fan, this might be a book you, you, you would want to check out. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I like, uh, definitely, like I said earlier, I just think it's really cool that, uh, uh, these are good. These, the, the, these particular franchises are good entry points for comics. So mm-hmm. I'm all for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I also was checking out, uh, the Grand Abyss Hotel, yeah. um, which is, uh, David Rubin, whose name particularly caught my eye. I'm not as familiar with Marcos Pryor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I am familiar with David Rubin because he did the, those really cool uh, The Rise of Aurora West uh, Battling Boy books, which I absolutely loved. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, they're doing a political satire thing, and it uses the word hyperviolence, so I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I noted this as well, and I'm not familiar with Marcos Pryor's writing, but David Rubin, definitely, I'm, I'm on mm-hmm. board when I saw that cover, or mm-hmm. what may be a cover, I guess – for this, uh, as they're calling it, original graphic novel. It it just looks incredible. And then I read the solicit, and it won me over. So I'm definitely wanting to to check this out. Also, it it reminded me that we really haven't gotten anything from the Battling Boy universe in a really long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate. So I... 
I don't know. I I, I hope that Rubin and um, Paul Pope. Paul Pope, but yeah, but there's uh, someone else works with him on that as well. Oh, that's yeah. right. Um, yeah. But I but I hope that they get back into the groove, so to speak, because yeah. I, I I think that that had a lot of promise, and that came out that was coming out through first second, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was coming yeah. out from first second originally. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the plans are for the next volume, but clearly there was supposed to be another volume. So mm-hmm. I am I'm right there with you. Just like because give me have, my story. Yeah, we've got two <laughs> I think we've had two Aurora West books, but only one mm-hmm. battling boy proper. Right, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Which was supposed to be the main book. And so yeah, I'm very curious about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I know so I noted that, but I want to go back to one sixteen, what what Sturge had I think mistakenly wanted to refer to. And this is Ronan Island number one, um, mm-hmm. the first of a five issue miniseries written by Greg Pak with art by oh, Giannis. Um, okay, you is this? A, yeah, I was going to say this is my guy. Okay, so you <laughs> pronounce his last name. His name is well. If I go Greek, it's Giannis Mil- Milano Giannis. Okay, <laughs> there you go. See, I should have had you talk about this one instead. See, no, you got it. We got it now. Uh, but it, it it seems really interesting, and this is one that just strikes me is, specifically for an all age audience, not necessarily younger, but um, you know I- anyone could could read this. And it says, after a mysterious attack wipes out major cities of nineteenth century Japan, Korea, and China, survivors from all three lands find refuge on a hidden island and build a new society. So and then there's more to the solicit, but for time's sake, I, I won't go over it. But it looks really good, and then the yeah. one image of sample art that we have is very eye catching. Oh, yeah, I mean, 19th century samurai type warriors fighting mutated hordes. <laughs> Check. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what I say. No, and this is a, if I remember correctly, this is one of our gems of the month for uh, for January. Um, and yeah, Boom Boom Studios has got a. It's like it's a beautiful book. It looks like it's it almost looks animated, mm-hmm. which is actually a, which is a huge compliment. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm all for it. This is very cool. Yeah, I'm a fan of that. I mean, I'm, I definitely want to check that out. Not just because there's a Greek guy drawing it, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you're supporting your your fellow countrymen. That's right. Opa. That's all I say. <laughs> Now, the only other thing I have in the Boom Studio section is on page 223, and this is something else from the aforementioned Matt Kent. And, mm. and this, and I wanted to highlight this because this kind of underscores what I was saying earlier in terms of Department H and the kind of packaging decisions that I'm assuming it's Matt Kent who who's the one who, who makes the calls on this. And that is the first collection, the first volume of Black Badge, one that mm-hmm. he, uh, title that he does with Tyler Jenkins – is being collected now and in hardcover, you know, and they did the same thing with Grass Kings, another Boom Studio book. And then, as I said earlier, they also, or Ken also did that with Department H and Mind Management, coming out with the initial collections as hardbound editions. Yeah, I highlighted this one too. That's is, uh, uh, you know, like you said, it's Matt Kent, and this is, I, I just trade weight on him anymore. Um, this looks <laughs> fascinating. I know he's not drawing it, but. Uh, you know, I'm on board for he's just an cheater. He, I don't know how his mind works, but he comes up with these like high concept ideas that he executes perfectly, uh, and they're they're gripping. They're they got lots of stunning reveals and things like that. And I'm just in awe of his 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 writing. Hmm. Does anyone have anything else in Boom Studios? I have one a Boombox title. It's on page two thirty one. And it is called Midas, and it's uh, it's written by Ryan North, which that's one of the things that made me jump about it. He's the guy who does he, he the writer on on, on uh, Beatable Squirrel Girl and Dinosaur Comics and various other things, um, and with art by Braden Lamb and Shelley Paraline. I'm, I'm going to guess it's Paraline. Forgive me for mispronouncing, um, but this is about a space captain, uh, and crew and they're heading to earth and because earth has been abandoned and covered in gold and they find a ancient guy's dead body and it's king midas and it's basically they're, they're trying to get it and use it as a weapon which to me it's an interesting concept and i really enjoy north's uh, sense of humor and the way he kind of uses characters and plot um so i'm intrigued by this this is something i i, I was not aware of the series it's this is a collection of an eight issue series so I, this is very intriguing for me. 
Okay, so being finished with the Premier Publishers, that takes us to what some call the back half or others call the green section, basically smaller presses, even though some of these smaller presses are fairly sizable. And I first go, and, and this is like a, a twofer that I have on this page, on mm. 244. I can guess, I bet. Yeah, well, the first one is probably not what you would initially expect, but the one at, toward the top of the page is uh, Brian Fee's A Fire mm-hmm. Story. And this is a hardcover edition of a webcomic that he came out with not too long ago. And this is the story of him and his wife experiencing those fires back in uh, fall of 2017 that swept through Northern Mm -hmm. California. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with that webcomic, but I don't know if it won, but it was definitely nominated for an Eisner. Mm -hmm. But it is just a phenomenal story about what they experienced. And he lost everything, uh, or at Mm -hmm. least almost everything, but they lost their home. And it's about his experiences on that uh, and the web comic, it, I didn't think it was overly long. So I'm looking at the page count here and it says 160 pages. So I'm wondering if he's using the web comic as a basis and then building on that. I don't hmm. see anything unless I'm overlooking it in the solicit about this starting off as a web comic. Hmm. Yeah. So, it, so this I might know it be is. Enough. Yeah. It, I mean, I'm, According to Wikipedia, it's an 18 chapter webcomic. So maybe there's more to it than I don't remember. I mean, I remember it. I remember because I remember Mom's Cancer was this like incredible webcomic that he, he, he had and published and then took down. Um, and I saw this start, but I did not keep going. So I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. I also marked this one. I really enjoy his work uh, and enjoys, you know, maybe maybe too happy sounding yeah. a word, mm-hmm. but I, I really appreciate, you know, the, the kind of depth and, you know, him sharing his, his life experiences, even when they're particularly difficult. Yeah. Um, and it does mention in the solicit that it was posted online, but they, they don't use the word webcomic. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is an oversight in my book, but Hey, mm. there yeah. you go. But yeah, I'm, I would recommend that, that people definitely check this out. And this is going to be published through Abrams comic arts mm-hmm. imprint. So that's really good. Uh, mm-hmm. They do great stuff. But under that is something that it's one of the things, one of the two things I would say that I'm most excited about in this month's previews catalog. Uh-huh. We'll get the second one later. Uh, it is probably something that people who know me say, okay, of course, yeah, this has to be something that Derek would appreciate. But this is, I'm really excited about. This is Bill Griffith's Nobody's Fool, The Life and Times of Schlitzy the Pinhead. Mm-hmm. And this is also coming out. Interestingly enough, from from Abrams, I would think that this would come out from Fantagraphics, but nope, it's a it's an Abrams comics art book. I think they put out his other one too, though, didn't they? Did they put out Invisible Ink. No, that was Fantagraphics. Was it? Yes, it was. Mm. Uh, and and the thing about this, this is not the first time that Griffith has written about Schlitzy. Every now and again in the Zippy the Pinhead strips, there would be a mention of Schlitzy, but there are even, I don't know, one or two strips from what I remember where he does talk or Zippy may talk or the character Griffey may talk a little bit about Schlitzy the Pinhead. But here we have a full-fledged biography. It says it's 256 pages uh, about the life of Schlitzy. Hmm. Yeah, that definitely Uh... jumped out at me, too. Okay, sorry. I'm looking at the solicitation, and I'm actually discovering this in real time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this, so this was actually the, what the movie Freaks was based off of. Partly, yes. Or one of the one of the, or particularly the, that particular character. Right. And okay, and then Zippy the Pinhead is also based off of this character. It's also an inspiration for Zippy, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or this real life person, I should say, not a character. Mm-hmm. Huh. Okay, that's that's actually really cool. Like, yeah, I'm I'm discovering this in real time. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, Bill Griffith is one of my favorite artists, I guess, from the underground period. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. it's interesting because this is a guy who eventually took Zippy the Pinhead over to King's Feature Syndicate. And, well, first and foremost, I wouldn't think that Zippy would be a strip for King Features. But it's also interesting that you have one of the legendary underground comic writers in American history – Having to strip through King Features. So, sure. you know, which has so many, yes, yeah, so many safe 
and almost yeah. sanitized, if I can use that word, uh, mm-hmm. comics. But uh, there you go. That's the wonder of Bill Griffith. Yeah, yeah. like that's absurd, really interesting. The absurd cultural criticism and observation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I always yeah. remember Zippy as kind of the comic strip that was like kind of over my head as a kid. <laughs> so I just <laughs> so I just kind of look at it and be like, this is kind of cool, but kind of weird, just freaking me out. So mm-hmm. I think it's time. I, it's past due that I uh, that I find out more about this this particular comic and this particular person. Definitely. Yeah. And then yeah. ask yourself as you're reading Zippy. Am I having fun yet? <laughs> oh yeah, and then have yeah. Always, uh, Tabasco sauce in it. Yeah, <laughs> donuts and Tabasco sauce. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was intrigued by that. I was also intrigued uh, by uh, the title right next to that to the left, uh, the bridge. About it's a it seems to be a history of the Brooklyn Bridge, um, which to me is also fascinating uh, as a piece of nonfiction. Uh, it's written by Peter J. Tomasi, who's written some Superman comics. But yeah. you know, uh, Abrams Comic Arts put out some mm-hmm. some impressive titles. So, well, the bridge is a resolicit. This came out oh. at least two years ago, maybe three. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, tells you what I've I've yeah. been paying attention to. But it's in it trade paperback now. I don't know if the original was hardbound or paper, huh. but anyway. But yeah, this is uh, and and. The, Abrams, as as a number of these publishers in the back half do, many times they'll re-solicit something along with huh. new stuff. Sorry, I usually read that. I didn't see it there. Okay. Now, two pages later, this is on 246, I mm-hmm. wanted to mention that we have solicited volume uh. two of Terry Moore's Strangers in Paradise 25. Mm-hmm. And this volume's called Hide and Seek. Um, big fan of Strangers oh, yeah. in Paradise or basically anything that Terry Moore does. And mm. we can say now, because he has responded, and I think I've told you this, Sturge, oh, yeah. that I've... uh Terry has gotten back in touch with us. I had requested about a week or so ago if you know, said ask him, I said, Hey, do you want to come back on the show in February when that last issue of Strangers in Paradise twenty five comes out? And he said, Sure, because we've interviewed him at least three times on the Comics Alternative, two in audio podcasts, and once I did a printed one for the blog, mm-hmm. or a text-based interview for the blog. But we're going to have him back on to talk about the entire wrap-up of Strangers in Paradise 25. Mm-hmm. So to prepare yourself for it, if you don't have the individual issues of P- Strangers in Paradise, then pre-order Volume 2 of the trailer. There you go. See, he's going to get the five timers jacket. Him and Craig Yo. <laughs> yeah, Craig has had it for years now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hello, Mr. New Year. Hello. Oh, yes. We welcome you here. We'll wipe our tears. Oh, yesterday. Where do you guys go next? Um, what do you, where do you go, Troy? Uh, you know, I just wanted to give this might be jumping a little a little bit ahead here, but like I just wanted to acknowledge Ahoy, uh, sorry, Ahoy Comics. Mm-hmm. Um, like uh, I actually got a chance to talk to uh, we were talking about Vertigo earlier. I got a chance to talk to uh, Tom Payer. Um, who is one of the uh, chief architects there, and Stuart Moore, who's another one of the chief architects over at uh, Ahoy Comics. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're just doing cool stuff. And like, there's this Edgar Allan Poe book that's uh, being highlighted this month, um, but they also did a really cool book about like called The Wrong Earth, which is basically what if Adam West Batman met Ben Affleck's Batman? <laughs> <laughs> um and it was actually it, like yeah it just tom payer is a veteran and like uh he's been in the game for a while so is Stuart moore and it shows they just understand they just understand story and just like why it's important and how to build like characters and like you know show the inverse of like some of your beloved uh beloved tropes so yeah so mm-hmm. definitely pay attention to Ohio comics you know, I have Edgar Allan Poe's Snifter of Terror on my to-read mm-hmm. list, and the the one that's solicited now in this catalog is number six. But I mm-hmm. still haven't read number one yet, so, but mm-hmm. I, I'm curious to see what they're doing. And also, uh, Peter Milligan does some of the writing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So it's definitely yeah, worth they, checking out. Yeah, they actually have – it's like very quietly. They have a very uh, – a, a big uh, – a, a large cast of like – 
talents like Grant Morrison Grant even Morrison, did like a yeah. back, yeah a backup for uh, the wrong earth so yeah it's just like a and it also is worth it's, it's your money's worth because like at three ninety nine you're actually getting a lot of story mm-hmm. and a lot of content which is also really nice. Well, before that, I had a couple of things. Um, I wanted to mention that on page 251, mm-hmm. and this is, I think, the only book that Ad House has in this catalog, uh, the, J- the January one. This is Matt Lesniewski's The Freak. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Almost anything that Ad House comes out with, I, I want to check out. Mm-hmm. And last week, I think it was, I got a media email from Chris at Ad House about this and had mentioned the possibility of maybe even having Matt come on the show to talk about the freak. So we may get an interview with him about this. If nothing else, cool. we can we can review it for one of our weekly shows. Yeah, this one jumped out at me too, just like for the same reasons you mentioned. Um, Ad House, everything they publish is pretty notable to me uh, and worth checking out. And, uh, you know, I wasn't familiar with this title or the creator because I'm a uh, in a hole sometimes, but um, I definitely would like to check that out. The, the premise of this is, is interesting. Basically, it's you know following around the world's ugliest person and seeing <laughs> kind of his travails. Yeah. So because he is hated and often pummeled in the streets. You gotta like the pummeling. Pummeling, that's right. right. Yeah, it sounds it sounds tragic. No, Ad House is really cool, and actually they're from they're uh, based out of my backyard, Virginia, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, they they did a bunch of. I think they did Street Angel before Image got it. Yes, um, and um, they also did a, a book that I wish more people knew about, and I wish I could find again called Johnny Hero, which I absolutely loved as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, definitely a cool publisher. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now on that next page, two fifty two, we have yet another new series from AfterShock, and it's mm-hmm. almost gotten to the point that with AfterShock, they come out with so many new series, kind of like Image at least, or almost right. as much. Um, I, it gets to the point that I, I can't keep up with, so I don't even mention them <laughs> on these preview shows. There's a reason why I'm mentioning this one, and this is Dark Red number one. And the reason I'm <laughs> mentioning this is it is written by Tim Seeley, mm-hmm. the arts by Corin Powell. But reading about the premise, it reminds me of something that Seeley did a few years ago, I think for – I can't remember if it was Image or Dark Horse. It was Sanguine mm-hmm. that dealt with vampires, and that's what we have going on here. It says, Charles mm-hmm. Chip Ipswich is not one of those coastal elites with a liberal arts degree in a job at a social media startup who knows where the best brunch places are. No, Chip is one of those forgotten men. He lives in rural area in the middle of the country where Jesus still has a place at the dinner table and where factories send jobs to Calcutta. Chip is also a vampire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I like Seeley's work. I, I'm wondering mm-hmm. what kind of fascination now he has with vampires. Hmm. Oh yeah, well, he's got a bunch of horror titles. Yeah, he does. So yeah, I mean, he's the hack slash guy. I mean, yeah, like, right. if that doesn't say ha- uh, horror, <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. It, but it's it's kind of an uh, almost a caricature of horror. It's like over the top, and and yeah, even yeah. there's the titillating aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything until two sixty six. Two sixty six. I highlighted on page two fifty four. There's a. There's a, a new series out come, uh, called Out of the Blue. It's actually a two one of two graphic novels, and it's a uh, it's War Comics by Garth Ennis. And that's mm-hmm. maybe all I need to say to sell it. Oh um, yeah, yeah. If you like War Comics by Garth Ennis about World War II pilots, this might be a book for you. Yeah, that that one actually caught my eye too. I uh, I mentioned earlier that I dog-eared my catalog and then forgot to bring it with me. <laughs> but that was that was that was definitely a book that I was like, oh hey, Garth Ennis War Book, yeah, mm-hmm. okay, <laughs> oh, yeah. not a problem for me. I will buy that. Yeah, and it's nothing new because he does that all the time. But he does he it does so damn time. well. Yeah, yeah. right. And and this, it, I just saw it's uh, in an oversized European album format, so that's cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That must, which means the artist's work must be like pretty killer. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah, because uh, AfterShock doesn't typically do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, on page 266, there is the aforementioned Ahoy comics, the Edgar Allan mm-hmm. Poe's Snip Drip Tira <laughs> number six. But it's what's under that that I find particularly interesting, and that is the goon number one, but a number mm-hmm. one for Albatross Funny Books. <laughs> so here we yeah. – ha- I mean, I love the goon. It's been published for years, for almost yeah. – not entirely, but almost – 
the whole run of the goon at Dark Horse. But now right. we get the goon coming, I guess, coming back to Albatross. Because didn't Powell originally publish the first, I don't know, one or two issues of the goon himself through Albatross? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, and then it went to to Dark Horse, but now he's bringing mm-hmm. it back, mm-hmm. and so I'm glad that the goon is back. I love it. Well, I think if I, if I remember correctly, this is also because the anniversary is coming up. Mm. So goon is about to hit a, a major anniversary, and I'm not going to sit here and say I remember which number it is because I don't. <laughs> but um, I think it's 15 or 20, but I can't remember. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, so like this is kind of a homecoming for goon, and that's one of the other major reasons. I also want to point out that Grumble. Uh, is actually uh, a really fun book by Rafer Roberts and Mike Norton. I've wondered about uh, that. Yeah, uh, it's basically about a con man who, uh, you know, he's he he gets in trouble with uh, people who actually understand the world of the supernatural, and so as punishment, they turn him to a pug. <laughs> and his uh, his daughter, who's kind of a, who is definitely estranged, it now has to care for him. But in the meantime, everybody that he's ever owed is kind of coming back, coming coming for him. And so it's kind of a bit of a kind of crime. It's kind of a crime magic type thing that they're doing, but it sounds like a lot of fun. So definitely check that out. Yeah. And Mike Norton loves his pugs. So yes, he does. Does he does. Where do you guys go next? Um, I have something on page 277. I don't know if you have anything before then. I, I go there. Exactly. No, uh, I'm just going to apologize because I'm using my phone right now. <laughs> no worries. So uh, if I if I force you guys to, to jump back, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, uh, on 277, we got Sabrina the Teenage Witch number one, which yeah. is one mm-hmm. of five issues, and it looks like it's like in line with that that new Netflix series. But mm-hmm. it's written by Kelly Thompson and art by Veronica Fish, and I love both of those creators. So I'm kind of I'm intrigued to see what they come up with. Um, mm-hmm. So, and it'll probably have a little bit more realistic horror feel to it. So, I, I'm in, I, I'm in for that. So, actually, the funny thing about this, and I don't want to burst your bubble here, <laughs> is it's going to be more of a traditional take on Sabrina, yeah. and and that's because uh, the uh, the um, the series that the TV show is based off of oh. still still exists. <laughs> it's one of those we're slow moving about, series. Yeah, was, we were talking about that earlier. Like it still exists, uh, but this is, I guess, an alternative uh, for people who are, you know, people who remember the uh, the the classic Archie Sabrina, or even that uh, God what was it the uh, TGI Friday, yeah, yeah, show <laughs> TV show. So, or maybe it was Nickelodeon. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, Kelly Thompson. Uh, yeah, it's a good team. Veronica Fish uh, should be like really upbeat and a lot of fun because that's kind of like their staple. So. Hey, I'm even more into it now. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm. I'm. I'd like to check out this first issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then Where I do don't, you go for- I don't oh, have go anything until two eighty six. Well, I don't have anything until two eighty seven. So you win. <laughs> okay, so on two eighty six, uh, I wanted to just point out a couple of titles from Avery Hill. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have Deep Space Canine from Comic Book Slumber Par- uh, from Comic Book Slumber Party. I think that that's a resolicit. Maybe I'm wrong. I remember seeing that cover before, but then under that is I think a new title. And this is mm-hmm. uh, Ismire. I guess that's how you pronounce it. I S M Y R E. <laughs> and this is by B Muir. <laughs> which mm-hmm. you know interesting name uh but it says in the city of ismire ed the sculptor works as a wind widower neighbor as his widower neighbor sings strange melodies late into the night he places the finished figurine and notices that there's an empty space on the shelf where another one should be perplexed he sleeps while his neighbor continues to croon and then it goes on from there i really have been enjoying more and more what I see coming out of Avery Hill. And this seems like mm-hmm. another title definitely worth checking out. Yeah. I looked hard at this one too. Uh, it, it seems really interesting. I just, I have a long list today <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> all right, this is borderline. This would have been an honorable mention, but I would, I agree with you. Avery Hill has been putting out some great books. So yeah. I think this is well worth checking out. Okay. So you say you go to that next page. I go to the next page to a, a hardcover, uh, called just like rube goldberg which seems to be a biography slash 
um, history of Rube Goldberg and Rube, Rube Goldberg machines. So that to me is just I, sometimes hmm. I'm just into a good historical book, and this seems yeah. like that kind of thing. It's not very long; it's 48 pages. So I, I don't know a lot about Rube. I've seen some of the old uh, cartoons that he drew, uh, hmm. so I'd be in for, for for checking this out. Yeah, that's actually really cool. It's another one I'm just discovering in real time. Hey, yeah. And then I don't think I have anything until, well, actually I have Labrador on the next page, 288, which is a black mask book, Mm -hmm. which seems like uh, it's about a pair of vigilantes. They they break into a lab where illegal tests are being run on animals, but the animals, it turns out, are now like killing machines that they have to contend with. So I don't know. I've, I've, I've enjoyed a bunch of the black mask titles. So this just seems like, like I said, sometimes I just want like a, a fun action book, and this seems like a fun action book to me. Yeah, I, I don't have anything until two ninety nine. Okay, um, I, actually, I might have that same book. So, and this is one that we're gonna discuss, I think, on an upcoming episode. Sturge and I are planning on doing an episode of the weekly show devoted specifically to relatively recent adaptations mm-hmm. and, and we've been over the past couple of months getting review copies of several of these books and this is one i think to add to the pile it's oh, yeah. it, it's gonna be, it be uh a bigger one than i anticipated uh and this is from candlewick press the adaptation of the iliad mm-hmm. and this <laughs> is adapted and drawn by gareth hens oh yeah i'm excited by this one because his adaptation of the Odyssey is a book that there's a there's a teacher in town that teaches that adaptation, and I go in and work with her students with it, and it's one of the most one of the more rewarding parts of the year for me because they really get into that book, and that book is gorgeous. So I'm glad to see that. Well, the other half of the the Homer books, the Homer epics, is is coming out from him. Although the Iliad, I don't know. You've I'm assuming you've read the Iliad. Um, it's kind of a boring book. It's a, it's a lot of like, there's, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, yeah. our friend, the street guy and the spear is going to go through his head and he's never yeah. going to see the shores of Delos again. Like that like, thing. The Iliad reminds me of uh, taking Latin in high school, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, but it could be, I mean, but you know what I like, it could be interesting. No knock to Gareth Hines. He could be doing oh, yeah. something really cool. Oh yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I'm hopeful because he's he's a great adapter and he he makes some interesting books. Mm. Mm-hmm. That next page, I have something else, and I'm not familiar with this publisher, Cave Pictures Publishing. Have either mm-hmm. of you heard of this, or are you familiar with them? Cave Pictures so. Publishing. Well, yeah, I don't remember seeing them in catalogs before. Maybe I've just overlooked it. But one of their titles <laughs> that, and they have a couple listed here, but. I guess a new series, we have a number one issue, The Blessed Machine. Mm-hmm. This is written by Jesse Hamm and Mark Rogers with art by Jesse Hamm. Yeah. Oh. I, go ahead. That's a, that's a cool, creepy cover. I will it say does. that for sure. That's what got my attention. I think if I didn't see that cover, I don't know if I would have paid this as much attention. But then the solicit seems interesting. It says, the Jacob, son of administrator Anna A3644 – which tells you something about the setting of this, Uh is revisited by the recurring dreams that plagued his youth. He believes the dreams indicate that the Earth's surface, once rendered uninhabitable by a horrific malfunction of the Large Hadron Collider, is now safe. But can he convince those who live underground with him? Uh And at what cost? Oh, yeah. Seems interesting. That's that's very cool. Yeah, this is... Like just visually, I'm like I'm I'm already loving this book. I hope it's as good as this cover is, <laughs> and the and the and the premise description. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm excited by that one too. I, that one really was eye catching. Hmm. After that, I go to page three hundred three. I yes, let's go there. <laughs> and what I wanted to mention, I don't know if this is what you had in mind, Sturge, but under mm-hmm. Dead Reckoning. Mm-hmm. is The Night Witches, and this yeah. is written by Garth Ennis. So it has oh, yeah. something to do with war and with art by Russell Braun. Mm-hmm. Over the mm-hmm. past several months, I've been noticing more and more things that Dead Reckoning are doing. And in fact, in my conversation with Craig Yo recently, we talked about a Dead Reckoning book that he did for them, The Best of Don Winslow of the Navy. Mm-hmm. And 
I've gotten, as I think you have as well, Sturge, several yeah. review copies of texts by Dead Reckoning, and they seem to specialize in books that deal with military life in one form or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This one jumped out at me, too. Mm -hmm. And I haven't, I mean, I've looked through their pages. I've been impressed with what they, I mean, well, they got it. I'm not going to say a niche, but they, they, they seem to found their area that mm -hmm. they, they want to focus on. Hmm. And I hadn't read the stories about this. Uh, I, I have not read any of the Night Witch's stories. As, you know, it's it sounds like on the surface level, I looked at it, I was like, oh, it's a horror story by Garth Ennis. But it's actually it seems like a true life story about a battalion of uh, basically pilots, women pilots hmm. that were called the Night Witches. Hmm. And this is the three stories that are collected here in one volume. They, you know, they were published separately in other venues. And now they're all together here, which... To me, seems really. It, I'm excited about this. Like, like we talked about before, you know, Garth Ennis' war stories, or you know, that's some of his, his. That's his wheelhouse. Yeah, and I'm excited about this. Yeah, there's another guy. Just like we were talking about Jeff Lemire earlier. <laughs> like, he's just he just he just pops up everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like, and and like usually, if I see a Garth Ennis book, I'm like already on it. So, this is a. Uh, it's always cool to find another one. You know, he's just so prolific. Oh, yeah. So I'm excited by this one, too. And where do you go after that? I go to 305. Is it the Clyde fans book? This is the second thing uh -huh. that I'm most excited about. Remember when I was talking about the Schlitzy book, the biography, mm -hmm. I said that th that was one of two. This is the second one. And I knew mm -hmm. it was coming out at some time in the spring. I didn't know that Drawn in Quarterly was going to publish Clyde fans in a slipcase edition. Mm hmm. <laughs> But yeah, this is, of course, by Seth, and this is collecting all of his Clyde fan storylines from, I can't remember how many years worth. Of, a long time. Yeah. 20 years in the making. That's yeah, of his uh, Palookaville. So mm -hmm. now yeah. I had the pleasure of interviewing Seth actually a couple of times, but I think for the first time for the podcast, an audio interview, a not quite a year ago, and this was just a little while after that last installment of Clyde Fans came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was in issue number 23, I think, of Palookaville, which also was resolicited here mm -hmm. in this catalog. But now we have the entire storyline in, I think, one volume. Now, it says up uh, toward the top of the solicit, Clyde Fans Box Set Slipcase Edition. So mm -hmm. at first I thought, okay, well, this comes in at least two different volumes. But then toward the bottom of the solicit, it states presented in a deluxe slipcase edition. So it doesn't yeah. say anything like multiple books in a slipcase, or it could be just one book, mm -hmm. one volume in a, in a nice slipcase. So they're a little unclear there, but I'm glad that this is coming out. I'm on board for anything that Seth does, and if it means me double dipping, I don't give a damn. I will. I will get it. He's an incredible storyteller, artist, and designer. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, he's got all the chops. He's cool. one of those people that in the '90s just got me super excited about comics again. Um, yeah. With him and Chester Brown and Joe Matt, kind of like that little. Oh yeah, the trio, little, the Canadian mm -hmm. trio. Yeah, although Matt's originally not Canadian, but he lived there right. for a while. But he did all his work at, in Toronto, well, all the stuff that I really yeah. watched. But yeah, I'm I'm excited about that too. It's a little pricey, but I think it's it's 20 years in the making. So how can you not buy that? And I'm sure yeah. you can get a great discount at the website of our sponsor, Discount mm -hmm. Comic Book Service. Tell them we sent you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I went to the next page. The next thing I highlighted was a graphic novel called Palimpsest. By Lisa is, Woolrim. That's the one, mm -hmm. and it sounds Wolverine, intriguing. Oh, uh, Spor uh, George Blum. I didn't say so, her very last name. <laughs> Lisa Wolrem Scholzblum. Um, it's to me seems interesting. Um, it's about uh, basically about thousands of South Korean children who were adapted around the world in the seventies and eighties, and I think this one is set in Sweden. So she's looking at, you know, kind of the the socio political and historical and by you know autobiographical implications of that's that kind of you know uh, occurrence so to me this is really interesting um you know one of my best friends growing up was he's, he's south korean but he was adopted by americans and so 
I don't know if it's going to be like his life, but you know, I, I, I know a lot about him and what he's kind of done throughout the year. So I'm interested in seeing what this is about. Hmm. Hmm. Well, right beside that is something else that I'm looking forward to. And this is the next hmm. volume of Sigeru Mizuki's Katiro strips. This is hmm. uh, Katiro's Yokai Battles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it has seven stories that deal with uh, Mizuki's famous character, Kitaro. And I've read all of the other volumes of this. And in fact, on a past manga episode, Shay and I looked at the first five volumes of Kitaro mm -hmm. coming out from, from Drawn and Quarterly. Really good stuff. And, you know, whether you are a fan of yokai or not, it's, it's just fun stuff. And these stories are definitely all ages. You know, there's that little kid-friendly symbol mm -hmm. that you guys at Diamond put next to these kind of titles. But it is. Mm -hmm. But it, it, this is not just a comic for kids or manga for kids, but it's something that I think that everyone can enjoy. And also, it's of historical significance because Mizuki is a legendary mangaka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love, you talk about design. The, the covers of these are just eye-popping and just they just they just say, buy me. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I mean, this is going to be great <laughs> comics in here. Yeah. And they do come, these Katara volumes, in, in fact, we have at least two others that are resolicited, volume one and volume five, I see on the next page. Mm -hmm. They're smaller format. Um, they're about the size of, I guess, manga that, let's say, Viz Media or others like uh, Kadansha may put out. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're ongoing series, not like deluxe editions or anything, which are usually larger format. But Right, right. Yeah, so kids can get these in their hands and mm -hmm. read the heck out of them and trade them or whatever. That's right. Kids whatever do whatever kids nowadays. do today with their comics. That's, that's right. <laughs> these kids today with their bagging and boarding. <laughs> yeah. It's a real danger to society. <laughs> Okay. After uh, in, this is usually the case. After mm -hmm. Drawn and Quarterly, I just go right next to Fanographics, my two favorite publishers. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think. Let's see. Uh, Do you have anything before Fanographics? I don't think so. I think I go three twelve. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's Fanographics. Because we have Fanographics uh, listings on page three twelve and three thirteen. Mm-hmm. And I think I know one of the things you may point out. Uh oh, Sturge. I think that first one, right? Yes. 3D Sweeties. Oh, yeah. This is one of those creators that I've just kind of discovered, but I've fallen in love with. So uh, Julian Glander, and this is a hardcover uh, collection of lots of different stories. I really like this art style. And so uh, I don't know. I, I will buy this book and check it out because I don't know. There's it, there's something about it. It's just idiosyncratic, just that, cool. that kind of sense of humor and that pop cultural sensibility and – 3D C and it's certified cool. Yeah, it's it's on. Yeah, there you so, go. <laughs> so you heard, you didn't just hear it from me. It's like you know, it's, it's verified by other people. Yes, but there's a yeah, whole committee. There's a committee that we have, and uh, we you know talk about it for hours on end. It's for real. Yes. I mean, I, I, now, now Troy, I'm curious. I mean, how does a work become labeled certified cool? Um, you know, truthfully, uh, it's. I think what we tend to do is we have staff picks. Um, and every publisher has a, uh, a brand manager, right? And so to that brand manager kind of selects something from that, uh, their publisher that they think it should be highlighted. And, uh, that also goes alongside the, uh, certified at cool and the featured items. So it is definitely like a book that's being selected out of, uh, out of genuine interest and, uh, um, intrigue mm -hmm. and yeah, like, uh, that's kind of the selection process. So, Okay. I was say it's like four out of five dentists. Like you got to get that number. Yeah, there you go. Right <laughs> now, also on that page, and I think this is being solicited again. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is Bill Shelley's biography of James Warren. James Warren, Empire of Monsters, the man behind Creepy Vampirella, and the famous monsters. And I think I think this was solicited previously, and I'm wondering if it has everything to do with the fact that the release date was kind of screwed up, mm -hmm. at, at least on Amazon. And the reason why I know that is I've had Bill Shelley on the show a couple of times for interviews, and then when I saw this book, 
I got in touch with Bill, and I knew he was working on a James Warren biography, and I asked him again, hey, would you like to come back on the show? And he said, sure. And we were talking about doing this sometime in, I think, January, because Mm -hmm. that's when the book on Amazon was listed as a a pub date. And so then I got in touch with Jack Cohen over at Fantagraphics, and she said, what Amazon has is incorrect. It's actually going to come out, and I think it's April. Uh, Okay. So we had, and and Bill didn't know this. And so Jack mentioned something about having to get that straightened out. So maybe it has something to do with this initial mix up in terms of release date. Hmm. Now yeah. this is a this is a great little bit of uh of both uh film and comic book history. Yeah, mm-hmm. this is a really cool book. I actually just recently uh when Famous Monsters of Filmland uh decided to start republishing again, I start I kind of fell into a rabbit hole about the history of that particular magazine. Um so it's, you know, my my interest in this is only like a couple of months um old, but at the same time like yeah, just the number of people that uh that magazine inspired and you know, this guy in particular as the publisher of that magazine, just really cool. Mm. Oh, yeah. And also, Shelley does a really good job when it comes to biographies. And in fact, his <clears throat> his Harvey Kurtzman biography won him an Eisner Award a few years mm-hmm. ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I liked his autobiography, although I haven't read the new edition. I read the original edition, so I'm kind of eager to. Oh, his to uh, autobiography or memoir of being a fanboy? Yeah. Like, Something in Wonder. I forget what it was called mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. But I, I do enjoy – I did enjoy reading that and I'm looking forward – especially after the interview because he talked a lot more about what, what went into that second edition. So he's he's somebody I, – I like reading his uh, his historical scholarship on comics in general and just talking about fandom. Uh, yeah, he's, 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 a, he's one of my favorite authors in mm-hmm. comics. I also want to point out that uh, since we since we're mentioning uh, famous monsters of filmland, uh, they they actually they actually have apparel <laughs> ah. in, this month, in this month's catalog, which is actually pretty cool. And I kind of want this famous monsters of filmland uh, beanie. So, <laughs> A beanie. There you go. There you go. Wow. Dang. I like Jughead, so I'm all about a beanie. <laughs> there you go. Exactly right. Actually, Archie had a crown one last uh, last right. month that was actually pretty cool. So, <laughs> oh man. Well, Sturge, you were talking about Bill Shelley being a legend in terms of comics and comics culture. And on the topic of legends, if we turn to the next page, three thirteen. We have something that I very much expected to see. I didn't know when, but this is Jaime Hernandez's entire storyline. Is this how you see me? Mm-hmm. And so is this story, which is basically Jaime coming back to Maggie and Hopi because mm-hmm. I mean, he's, you know, he's been doing over the past several years, Maggie and Hopi bits, but he also has other narratives within his world that he's juggling at the same time. You know, there's there's Frogmouth, there's her sister, there is Angel Ramirez, is Martinez or Ramirez, I can't remember. But I mean, there are a lot of other characters that he's dealing with now. And right. it's not as if I felt that Maggie and Hopi were being not pushed to the side, but maybe not as much attention on them. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I love his Maggie and Hopi stories and was really excited a few years ago when he started this reunion. So basically Maggie Hopi and others from Hoppers get back together mm-hmm. for a class reunion or not, not a class reunion, but a reunion of, you know, the punk rockers that they right. were. And so there is, are many references back to the earlier Maggie and Hopi stories, the locus uh, mm-hmm. narratives. Um, and he's been doing this for the past several issues, first of the Love and Rockets new stories, you know, the graphic novel, if you want to call it that, right. uh, format, and then the more recent magazine format that they started again a couple of years ago. But mm-hmm. um, we had the last installment a few months ago, so now we get everything collected. And this is great. We haven't had a collection of a Jaime storyline since – God, was it 2014 with the Love Bunglers when that was collected? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I only know that because it's resolicited underneath, and that's uh, February 14th. So yeah. it's been a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then before that, it was God in Science, the Return of the Thai Girls, mm-hmm. which actually yep. I think was I think part of it, if I remember correctly, was it was in the new the stories. And, yeah, in the new stories. I don't know if everything was. I can't recall. It's been a while. A lot of it. A lot of it. I think yeah. there's a there's a few. 
sequences that are in the the book, mm-hmm. but not in the the original, the sequential, you know, the the the, the new ser- the new comic series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm wondering if there's going to be any kind of new or revamped art mm-hmm. or story in "Is This How You See Me." Mm-hmm. But it's good. I, I, you know, the, the Hernandez brothers in my book, either, well, I was about to say can't do wrong, maybe almost can't do any wrong. Uh, <laughs> and so I will go out of my way to see anything that Gilbert or Jaime or even Mario for that matter. Uh, oh, yeah. Does. Oh, yeah. I agree. Yeah. And I'm kind of intrigued on the same page. There's a going from a legend to a first timer. There's a book on there called Alienation by Inez Estrada that looks really mm-hmm. intriguing to me, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where it's it's kind of like a, I don't know, a future where lots of things, uh, virtual reality affects diet, sex lives, and nightly dreams. And mm. it's about an erotic dancer and an oil rig worker trying to have a romance. And it just sounds like there's a lot going on in this book, but the cover looks, I don't know, I, I really like that cover. It looks amazingly detailed and there's mm-hmm. lots of animals and strange creatures so uh, i want to check that book out yeah it's very it looks definitely looks like an underground comic mm-hmm. like yeah it's just it's just funky and cool yeah mm-hmm. yeah now so. it, it now she is i guess new to fantagraphics but i right. knew of some of her other stuff and I, I think i know her primarily through and i can't remember if this is self-published or if some other very small press put it out her book impatience Ah. And she also has a number of, like I guess, uh, you, I guess you could call them mini comics. If if you go to Porcelino's Spit and a Half and uh-huh. do a search for her name, you will see that there are quite a number of things that I don't know if they're still available, but he still has listed, even if he doesn't have any more um, mm-hmm. the titles that Inez Estrada has has come out with. So I think that her, I know she has something coming out. Soon, I thought it mm-hmm. would have been this year from Kilgore, and the right. reason I know that is because I backed the 2018 Kilgore oh, okay. releases, and I still haven't gotten what Estrada was supposed to release. I guess she may be a little late with this, so it's good that she's coming out with something with Kilgore. But mm-hmm. I think it's even better. As much as I love Dan, you know, Fantagraphics does have bigger exposure in sure. more distribution muscle, so uh, this mm-hmm. will get her more of an audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's cool. Always cool to discover new talent. Mm-hmm. That's right. Or upcoming. It's Father Time, that unrivaled producer of mammoth spectacles whose record of hits is a matter of history, back with his latest and most astounding production, The New Year. After after Fanographics, we get on page 314, first, second, which, mm-hmm. again, they always do great stuff. And two titles that, Sturge, I'm sure you and I will be discussing in the spring – is Kathy G. Johnson's The Breakaways and Colleen Alf F. Uh, Venable and Ellen T. Crenshaw's Kiss Number Eight. Mm-hmm. And the reason I mention that is because we've been talking with the publicist at First Second about doing another publisher spotlight on First Second Spring releases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I agree with you. There, to me, you know, the Drawn and Quarterly and Fantagraphics are you know definitely in the top top two. Well, they are the top two in a lot of ways, but first second is quickly become maybe the three. Mm-hmm. I yeah. mean, especially for the definitely for graphic novels aimed at younger audiences, but they also do ones for adults. And I, I've been imp- highly impressed with what they put out. So I'm looking yeah. forward to both of these just because who puts them out? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, like everything from Battling Boy to like, I think I read an Andre the Giant uh, mm-hmm. biography that was about through them. That was actually really good. So, oh, yeah, yeah I, I think First Second is also really cool. Yeah. And, I mean, they got McMillan behind them, so they, they got high production, and they, they've mm-hmm. had lots of great talent. Yeah. And I think curatorship of, like, the comics that they put out. All right. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of, of their output. So I'm looking forward to these books and our episode, our spotlight. Mm-hmm. I go next to page 322. Do either of you have anything before that? I... Uh, I... Do not. Okay. And I guess I, I don't have a lot to say about this, but I, maybe more of a question than anything. On page 322 under this, or It's Alive, mm-hmm. is um, Glansman and Newman's D-Day from the pages of combat. Yeah. It's, a, it's a one-shot. 
And I know that It's Alive and, and Drew Ford, who's behind It's Alive, mm-hmm. have been coming out with these reissues of various Glansman war comics. Right. Um, and some of these I know that he's been doing through Kickstarter. Is, is this another Kickstarter? Do you know? Or I'm, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised because of what you said. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's definitely been yeah priming the pump with the Kickstarter to, to put these volumes out. So. Um, I'm glad to see them uh, because I think they're good comics and, you know, as piece as historical objects too, I think they're very important that we have them out there mm-hmm. and they're good comics. Yes. So but, yeah, I don't know much more about them. Yeah. So there's that. And then I have something on page 329. I do too. Ah. It might be the same thing. Cause it's a big picture on that page. <laughs> okay. Then uh, please talk. Is it Hap Haven? Is that what it is? No, that's no, page three, no, 330. I've I skipped stiletto number one. Yeah. Mm. Officer down. Mm-hmm. This sounds intriguing to me because this is one of those Lion, Lion Forge comics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is a kind of, a you know, you and I both are big noir comic fans. And this is a self-contained uh, story. It's four-ish. It's 48 pages. It's a 599. So it's a, you know, it's a little more substantial comic, but it's a. Uh, it's it's a crime story and it's it seems like uh it has to do with police killings and investigations and to me this sounds just like a like a, like, i don't know like this is just a comic i'm in for and i i kind of am, am intrigued by this format to see if they have a kind of you know self-contained not super long not super short comics mm-hmm. um I, I don't know to me it's, it's it's kind of an interesting experiment in the format too right yeah and yeah, this is written and drawn by Polly Schmidt. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's also uh, something in the solicit that says helping hand program. And I have no idea what that is. Helping hand program. Yeah, that's true. And I know that, that Line Force has a number of imprints, but this is not an yeah. imprint. It's a program. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That might be like some sort of outreach. I'm not sure. I know they've done like uh, charitable stuff before. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I, like, I, I wish I knew what that was. Now, if we go to page 330 and 331, we have what, Sturge, you had referenced, and I think you wanted to talk about. I did. There was a, It's called Hap Haven, and it is another new series, or actually, it's not a series. Well, is it a series? It's a, it's a, it's a book. It is a paperback, and it's about a superstitious uh, young woman who breaks her mother's back, which is, you know, <laughs> we were always warned, right? Mm-hmm. And she goes to this world looking for things um, where rabbit's feet actually have power and there's lots of superstitious uh, r- but real things going on. I don't know. To me, it's just fascinating. It's kind of like a, this kind of magical, realistic kind of story. Um, and the cover looks intriguing to me. It, it kind of – it's not like – it's not Mage, the, the, the Matt Wagner book. But, you know, she's got a bat. She looks like she's ready to, to, to romp, and she looks like she's going through a field of leprechauns. Um, so to me, this is just – I'm a fan of like this kind of magical, superstitious kind of world fantasy thing. I'm not the biggest fantasy fan, but you know, there's, there seems to be a troll on 331 <laughs> or a goblin, and he, he looks menacing. And <laughs> she looks like she's going to take that bat to him, which I'm impressed with. You know, I, I'm consistently uh, falling in love with Lion Forge. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, uh, not even necessarily for the uh, the Catalyst Prime stuff alone, but, like, just the other cool things that they're clear. I guess I'm assuming they're getting from other countries mm-hmm. and bringing over. Um, I picked up Ghost Money, mm-hmm. uh, which came out a few months ago. And that was another book that was, like, imported from France, brought over here. And it was, like, the coolest sci-fi action thing I've read in a while in a comic. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm currently reading Infinity Eight. Yeah, I like that um, which, uh, a lot. Which is just great because it's kind of got this Barbarella type, uh, you know, '60s kitsch like sci-fi vibe to it. It's like part Fifth Element, part like you know, mm-hmm. like a very particular type of sci-fi. Um, and I'm also and now and now I'm seeing this book called Gang of Fools mm-hmm. by James Otis Smith. Oh, on three thirty-four. Yes, I'm glad yeah. you mentioned that. Yeah, and I'm just like, this sounds like something I want to read too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, and like they described it, Black Mirror meets uh, Electric Dreams, uh, Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams. But the premise, if I could just read it real quick, sure. Like, yeah. um, 
Adidia's got one week to come up with ten grand for rent. Diane needs a cool condo in a hot neighborhood to boost her Q rating. Paul simply cannot keep it in his pants. Ishmael's keeping a secret from his fellow dance hall revolutionaries. Layla's autobiographical porno has attracted the Russian mob, and Mr. Chip hates you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. Just... <laughs> Your solicit is much more detailed than what I'm looking at right now. Oh, uh, okay. Uh-huh. Is it so different? Because you... I'm looking on my phone, so okay. I'm looking at the website. I'm looking at previousworld.com slash catalog. Oh, okay, because mm-hmm. I am looking at a PDF of the catalog, so this is what would be in the physical copy. And it mentions something about Aditi, but in terms of all the friends that you mentioned, it just says in a second sentence, and her friends aren't in much better shape. Oh, so, see, no, this is, the, yeah, the solicitation here sounds a lot more fun. Yeah, yours oh, is yeah. better, yeah. But no, this, but yeah, this caught my this, attention in the art by James Otto Smith as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like, yeah, it's, it's described as a cyberpunk, uh, a cyberpunk series about literally a gang of fools. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I just, I think that's really cool. I am um, also just, uh, also from Lion Forge, uh, hold on a second here. I saw another really cool one. Well, I, I did, I definitely mentioned Infinity 8 which I think everybody should be reading at this point because it's just a fun, fun book. Uh, let's see here. And there was something else I was looking at. Oh, Stiletto, which we already talked about. So, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are. I agree with you. That's a fun series. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving along, I don't have anything until 341. Is that? Uh, In the NBM section. I might have the same book. Ah. Um. Now, toward the bottom of the page are some resolicits from Cyril Pedrosa that we've mm-hmm. talked about before on our Euro comic show. But the thing mm-hmm. I really wanted to point out is, I guess, what you would consider a companion to what you and I discussed recently, Sturge, uh, the Beatles in comics. This is now the Rolling Stone in mm-hmm. comics. And so it's written by Seka, C-E-K-A. I'm not familiar with that writer. And then with as with the Beatles book, various artists who mm-hmm. who do this. And yeah. I, I'm wondering if it'll be the same kind of format because you know, as as we discussed on the show, it's not just comics, and so the title may be a little misleading because there are some pro pieces as well, some very short essays that accompany mm-hmm. the various comics that deal with different facets of the Rolling Stones and their history. Yeah. Oh, that, and the Beatles and their history. So I'm assuming the same thing with the Rolling Stones. Yeah, I remember that it had like little historical pieces with photographs and things, and I I really enjoyed that book, uh, the format of it. I was I was surprised by how much I was won over by it. So, you know, if this is the Stones version of that, I I'm definitely going to check it out. Um, and it is certified cool by four out of five dentists or four <laughs> <laughs> four out of five uh, comic comic book nerds. <laughs> there you go. So fire it up. Fire it there up. You go. Yeah. There you go. And read it. Fire me up. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. You were just what? I'm sorry. I just got going on my stuff. Actually, well, you know, I was about to. I was about to mention uh, the Gladstones uh, to backtrack and mention the uh, Gladstone School for World Conquerors mm-hmm. hardcover, just because it's a cool. What page book. is that on? Um, I could not tell you. Oh, that's right, because you're <laughs> reading. Okay, three thirty nine. But it's from Maneki Maneki Neko books. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's and on three thirty nine. Three thirty nine, and this one has been kind of this one's been in the catalog before, but I think it's individual issues, and I believe this is a collection. But it's cool because it's just about a secret academy of super of the supervillains kids, and so like yeah, it's just like it just looks neat. It just looks fun and crazy and upbeat, and I just it caught my attention. So, no, it was really cool. I, I read yeah. I read the fly, I think I read the first volume of it, and I really mm-hmm. enjoyed looking at it. It's a it's it's a fun book. It's a fun okay. evil book. Right. <laughs> I think yep. I skip the entire uh, Oni press section and mm-hmm. go next to page 355. Do you guys have something before that? Uh, no, I have something on 355, though. Okay. So what do you have? Well, actually, I have things like plural on 355 that then goes on to 356. Okay. It may or may not be the same things that you're looking at, but under Pegasus, and we've talked mm-hmm. about some Pegasus books in the past, this we one have. is a biography of Goya. It says, mm-hmm. Goya, the Terrible Sublime, which is written by El Torres with art by Fran Galan. So I'm sure that this is uh, an adaptation because they do a lot of translations. 
Mm-hmm. Or in translation, not, not adaptation. But they also do adaptations, in fact. In fact, uh, the some of the Pegasus books that we have discussed have been originally published in French, but they've been adaptations of, let's say, the work of Albert Camus stands mm-hmm. out. So um, that one. And then the other thing on 355, I, it's a series. So it begins on 355, and there's some solicits on 356. This is – I hadn't heard of this before from Portable Press – Show me history. Mm-hmm. And so these are books for younger readers. And we have uh, Show Me History based on Abraham Lincoln, another one on a- Alexander Hamilton, Amelia <laughs> Earhart, Martin Luther King. I hadn't heard of these before. Have either of you? No, but I like this this whole graphic classics thing they're doing. That's actually pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hadn't heard of those. But I, I, I was they definitely did jump out at me too because, like you said, it's a nice series of historical, you know, historical comics for kids. Right, yeah. I, l- I love how the covers make it look very exciting. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like Action packed. Yeah, That's it looks right. like Mark- Martin Luther King Jr. seems to be doing some sort of Tai Chi pose. This is actually <laughs> That's right. I was going to say, <laughs> That's yeah, right. Alexander Hamilton's going to jab somebody with his quill. He's not mm-hmm. signing. He's like, I'm really going to sign you. <laughs> <laughs> I, so it looks like it says Portable Press, but I also see Unique Studios um, uh, attached to some of these, hmm. which I think is kind of interesting. I don't know if oh, they're... Yeah. Well, at least to the Martin Luther King one. Yeah, they seem to do um, the art, maybe. Yeah, so, yeah. So that's really cool. Like that's, of course, uh, uh, the guys who uh, gave us Malika. Um, they've been doing a big thing with like uh, Nigerian superheroes, and it's actually really yeah. taken off. So yeah, that's interesting that they're also part of this as well. That's pretty cool. That's mm-hmm. wild. There's a there's another wild thing. I, I go to three. 3- 57? Oh, before you do that, though, oh. I just noticed something that I completely overlooked on 355, as if we don't have enough to talk about. Um, but, <laughs> so, again, 355, and this is, I think, the tail end of the Paper Cuts solicits. Mm-hmm. This is David uh, Gallagher and Steve Ellis's The Only Living Boy Omnibus. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned that because this is or was a webcomic, at least it started as a webcomic, that Sean... Kleefeld and I, who the guy who does the, the webcomic series with me, mm-hmm. discussed quite a while ago. And then I know that they started to publish print versions of the various volumes of The Only Living Boy. But I re- it's been a long time, so I've forgotten a lot about it. But I do remember enjoying this. So mm-hmm. now I, th- I guess it's complete because we have an omnibus edition. Yeah, and they even have a new series. There was a page before, The Only Living Girl. So they Oh, wow. I they, missed they, that one, get, too. You're right. So wow. I saw that one. But that, that's that's out there in the world too. Wow. So there's a whole lot of only living people. Hickory dickory dock. It's a minute to twelve o'clock. The magic hour when the new year is born. But what if we hear a little tin horn left all alone on the shelf? Where go? Why little boy blue sleeps on below. So what does he do? He gets to the bear and lands right on the little boy's head. And I wonder if you are highlighting, and I'm sure you are, the same thing that I wanted to highlight on 357. It's crazy looking. Giraffes on horseback <laughs> salad. Oh, my gosh. This is under Cork Books, and oh, yeah. it's written by Josh Frank and Tim Heidecker with art by Manuel uh, Pertiga. Pertiga, mm-hmm. Pertiga. Thank you. And, and go ahead. Describe what this is, Giraffes on Horseback Salad. It is a... <laughs> Is this a real thing? I guess it is a real. It's it's a it's a film collaboration between Salvador Dali and the Marx Brothers that never got made. So this is the. I don't know if this is real or fake, but you know, like ostensible, this is the the screenplay of the movie. So it's being you know it's unfilmable now because of these creators not being around. So they're going to make it a graphic novel, and it sounds just nuts. Mm. But yeah, but well, it, yeah. It says, according to the solicit, it said that this was, from what I'm reading here, that it actually did exist. And it said that the script, yeah. you know, was rejected by MGM Studios and it was thought to be lost forever. But author Josh Frank found it. And with comedian and writer Tim Heidecker and Spanish artist and comics creator Manuel Pertega, he's cr- recreated the film that Dolly and the Marx Brothers would have made as a graphic novel that presents the story in all its full color, full cinematic, fully wow. surreal glory. And according to Wikipedia, it is, you're right. It's, it's totally real. 
Now, this is what I love about the the back half of the catalog is you really do kind of stumble into some really fascinating titles. Like, I've I'm at a point now where like my books about history are mostly graphic novels at mm-hmm. this point, <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm, my father was a history major, so I like like have that like fascination with history in general. But like, yeah, th- these are there's just some really cool fringe things back here. Oh yeah, that and was... like just histories you wouldn't even think about. We've oh, got yeah. to discuss uh, this on a review show when it comes. Oh to yeah, that. I'm down with that. That's let's do that. Where do you go after this? I go to the next page, three fifty eight. All right, what do you got? And this is under Rebellion two thousand AD. And we, you know, we rarely talk about things that are solicited in the Rebellion two thousand AD section. Not because we don't necessarily like it. It's just I, I don't know. I've read some Judge Dredd, but I'm not a big Judge Dredd fan. And so mm. a lot of the let's say two thousand AD titles or series that have come out, I, I just I respect and I may have a little experience with, but it's just more of a lack of awareness or thorough awareness. This mm-hmm. one though seems different. And at the bottom of the page you'll see Fran of the Floods. And this is by Gascon Phil. I don't know if it's Phil Gascon. It says Gascon, comma, Phil. I don't mm-hmm. know. And then Alan Davidson. I don't know if Fran of the Floods was originally serialized in 2000 AD. It, oh, I see on the cover now that it had the, the word Genty. So, and that's another British publication, right? Uh, mm-hmm. 2000 yeah. Rebellion, 2000 AD Rebellion. So I guess it appeared in that publication. Mm-hmm. It, it looks interesting. Yeah. No, it does. Like no, uh, 2000, and, 2000 AD and Heavy Metal are both kind of branching out outside of their anthology titles lately. Mm-hmm. Um, and they and I like what 2000 AD is doing in particular because they're finding other like serialized magazines and finding stories that are ongoing and kind of just recollecting them. I just picked up a book called Black Max, which is about this World War One pilot who has a giant mutant bat. <laughs> and they just, yeah, and they just terrorize Europe, and it is so cool. <laughs> and it's from 2000 AD and Rebellion because they 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 grab the they grab the uh, the uh, original short stories and just kind of put them all together in one compilation. So yeah, very cool. Also, I see that they have a villains book out this month, which is all one shot stuff. So actually, if you want to familiarize yourself with uh, 2000 AD, it's probably actually a really good book to pick up. Oh yeah. Judge Death, front and center. Well, front, front and center. Front and uh, you know, bottom right. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. I highlighted a book uh, on this page, 358, called Bogart Creek, which is mm-hmm. kind of in the corner. Just seems like it's uh, – I'm not familiar with it, but it says it's similar to The Far Side, which I don't know about mm-hmm. that. But it sounds interesting to me because I like The Far Side and One Panel Comics. From Renegade Arts Entertainment. That's right. Drawn and written by Derek – Everndon. And he spells his name like I do. See? So he's got to be the, cool. It's the smart way to spell it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, claiming to be similar to Farside is that's a that's a tall order, but I yeah. mean, it also it also has my attention, so It does. And you know a lot of newspaper strips that have tried to follow in the wake of the Farside mm. and have kind of framed themselves as such they may be okay, but I think they always fall short. But then again, you know, you got Larson doing the far side. That's like the peak, right? Oh, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. anything other than that is going to be in the shadow. Yeah, totally. yeah. I mean, like in terms of like just one shot, snapshot, like comic strips, it was that or Family Circus. And I'm sorry, Far Side was way cooler. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or Love Is, if you if you remember that. But that's a little bit yeah. Uh, yeah, treacly. Yeah, I remember that too. Treacly? Let's get on a mug. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I go next to self-made hero on pages 361 and 362. Yes. I went there as well. So, and we got three new books that Mm -hmm. are solicited. There is blossoms in autumn by Mm -hmm. Zidro and with art by Amy de Jung. And I'm sure that that's a translation. Mm-hmm. And then under that, and, and I think that that is a work of fiction, is it not? I think so. Yeah. It's kind of like a, a a romance, but with people in the autumn of their lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're a little bit older. And then we have under that uh, a true story. It's Guantanamo Kid, the true story of Mohammed El Garani mm-hmm. by Jerome 
uh, Tubiana and Alexandra Franck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one jumped out at me as well. I mean, they both jumped out at me, but that one's, I think he was basically detained in uh, Karachi Mm -hmm. and then somehow ends up being packaged as a deal going to Americans and he ends up being in prison and he's the youngest guy in Guantanamo Bay or one of the youngest, which I mean, to me as a true life story, that's it's pretty, that's fascinating. gotta be fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One that I found even more interesting than those two from self-made hero is the mm-hmm. one at the top of page three sixty two, And this is Lomax collectors of folk songs. So this is a biography written and drawn by France, uh, Dukenzu, Duk, mm-hmm. Dushaju. I'm not sure how you pronounce the name, but basically it takes the lives of John and Alan Lomax. And, you know, if, if you don't know who they are, listener, definitely look them up. But what they did was in the early and mid 20th century, they went around and literally collected folk songs, you know, mm-hmm. and, and some of the stuff that they thought may soon go become long lost. And so they went around to a lot of rural areas with a recorder and made notes and make recordings of some of these classic songs that had, you know, quite a long history. But again, if this wasn't the stuff that more well-known presses, uh, record producers were, were coming out with, they thought would be lost. And so they wanted to collect all that for posterity's mm-hmm. sake. Yeah, that one. I also highlighted that one. That one sounds fascinating and uh, the kind of comic. I would, I would definitely I need to know more about the Lomaxes. Mm-hmm. Um, so. To me, like like Troy was saying, I get a lot of my history from comics as well of late. So this is one of those in that category for me. And Self Made Hero makes some great books. Yes. So I'm also a fan of them. Right under Self Made Hero is Silver Sprocket. And, and I want to mm-hmm. mention we have I there are a couple of resolicits, Catboy and Girls, that are toward yeah. the bottom, but there's what I think is a new release, and this is Magical Breakdown number two. Beatdown. The, beatdown. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, what did I say? Breakdown. Breakdown. Okay, I'm sorry. Magical <laughs> Beatdown, number two, uh, from, from Jen Woodall. And I mm-hmm. wanted to mention this because, you know, I said that we're planning on doing a first, second publisher spotlight. We're also in the new year thinking about doing a Silver Sprocket publisher mm-hmm. spotlight, looking at everything that Silver Sprocket did in 2018. Yeah. Which is maybe too tall of an order, but we're going to attempt it. Hey, no, no, no order too tall. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really cool one. Actually, um, the number one issue uh, caught the eye of several of our show hosts. Uh, what we what we try to do is we try to, um, you know, we 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 do these monthly videos where we catalog. We we sorry, we zero in on uh, particular comics that are like you know for particular subgenres or subcategories, and we do an indie edge one, which is all indie books, and magical beatdown showed up. And uh, I think it showed up in another another video that we did because our hosts select these things and they actually really uh, gravitated towards that, which made, which made me interested to check it out because it's like Sailor Moon meets a, and like it's a street street harassment revenge fantasy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's very very bizarre, but bizarre is kind of my thing. So yeah, hey, well, I'm, I'm, it seems cool to me. It's pink and blue, and she's got a giant sword and looks like she's covered <laughs> in blood. So. <laughs> Let's do that. Yeah, it's neat. That cover is really cool, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I go next to Titan. I don't know if you guys have something before the Titan. I section. don't. Okay. On page 369, and I'm, I'm, I guess I wanted to ask you to educate me a bit if you know about this. Uh, at the top of that page is the first volume of Emma Vicelli and Claudia Leonardo, uh, Leonardi and Andrea Izzo's Life is Strange. And Apparently, Life is Strange is based on a video game, and I'd heard of it before, but I don't know anything about it. I'm not – I like to play games. I just don't have time, so I don't consider myself a gamer. Do either yeah. of you know about Life is Strange? I don't. Um, I just know what I see when I pass my friends who are playing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks – it's it's kind of like, a, for lack of a better term, a choose-your-own-adventure title. Okay. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so it's like kind of like a, it's kind of, yeah, it's like a, yeah, you get to select uh, the past of these particular characters. It's not an action, it's not an action story at all. It's more of an emotional drama. Hmm. Um, and I'll, that's all I'll say about it because I don't want to get hate mail or anything for you guys. Okay. Right. But yeah. Which sounds like a game that I would like to play because I, I don't yeah. necessarily like the, you know, every second action packed kind of game. Mm-hmm. I like one where you do have to think through things and establish relationships and kind of a yeah. slow build. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of an RPG. I think it, the closest thing I could uh say it's similar to is the Telltale games, if you're familiar with any of that. Um where okay, like, you know, yeah. they have the Walking Dead thing where it's like, you know, you get to select certain paths. Like a very point and click type thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So hmm. Yeah. I don't know much about it, but it does look intriguing. Yeah. After that, I go to page 376. Okay. What do you got there? And this is under the University Press of Mississippi. Now, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that you guys, Troy, at Diamond did in terms of making your changes is combining the book and comic section. Mm -hmm. And and I have to tell you, I feel mixed about that. I feel better Mm -hmm. about it than I did, let's say – when 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 the change first happened, because mm. at first I was kind of thrown, but I think that you guys do a pretty good job of indicating if a work is an example of prose or not. Mm-hmm. Um, now, under the University Press of Mississippi section, of course, if you know about University Press of Mississippi, it, it's all going to mm. be prose, right? It's not going to be original right. comics. They've got some resolicits there, but the one that I'm particularly interested in is the comics of Rutu Modan. Yeah. And I'm assuming that this is a critical study. It says the first in-depth study of acclaimed work by the pioneer of Israeli comics. However, hmm. it says that um, Rutu Modan is listed as the artist. I'm assuming that's for the examples that are included and the cover, which is something that I don't know if University Press of Mississippi has done with a solicit before. Maybe they haven't. I haven't noticed. So I don't know if there's going to be any new original Modan comics, but who knows? Mm-hmm. Huh. That's interesting. I don't know. I love her work, and yeah. I've, I've um, reviewed in one form or another a few of her books in the past. So I'm glad to see that this study's coming out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've read a bunch of her work, and I'm really impressed with it. So this is something I, if I have to do the the deep dive into her career, this is where I'm going to go. Yeah. And then I think I have one other thing before the manga section. I am finished. Period. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, period. Wow. Okay. So yeah. on, on 383 under Vault Comic, and it's a rarity that we mentioned anything about Vault. Just because I'm not as aware of their titles, but this one seemed interesting, and it was the cover that caught my attention: "Queen of Bad Dreams," number one, yeah. mm-hmm. written by oh, Danielle yeah. Lorick with art by Rafa Labasco. Hmm. Yeah, yeah I don't, I don't know a lot about this one. Yeah, hmm. but like, yeah, the cover, the cover looks really cool, though. Yeah, it says when a dream entity known as a figment emerges from a dreamer's mind. It's Dower's job as an IJ to track them down and make the call, reinsert mm. the figment, or grant them agency in our world. Mm. Seems yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. I That's didn't cool. read the whole. I didn't read the whole solicit, so I should have read the whole solicit. That sounds <laughs> really cool. Yeah. Ah, what, um, I, what good are you? I know. <laughs> I feel shame. Great I do want to. I do want to point out that uh, uh, Valiant Comics is actually introducing a whole new slew of uh, new creative teams on uh, like original characters, not characters that have been previously established like by the uh, previous Valiant line, but something completely new. And uh, Toya Harada actually got my attention, um, largely because it's from Joshua Dysart, who um, and Miko Suan Suyan, who I'm probably saying wrong, whose name I'm probably saying wrong, uh, but. Uh, Joshua Dysart in particular did uh, Unknown Soldier for Vertigo like a few years back, which was actually I loved. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so I'm very curious to see what he does with this particular character. It's kind of a uh, an original character that's, that's spun out of, I believe, like their recent Harbinger Wars event. So yeah, just something to take note of. Hmm. And I'm glad that you mentioned Valiant because mm-hmm. I always – not always, but many times I feel kind of bad that we don't give Valiant more attention during these preview shows. And I think the yeah. reason is many of their titles kind of hover 
in an in between territory. I think yeah. some of it you would consider superhero ish, and I think that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons why we don't mention it as much. But then mm-hmm. again, they do a lot of things that aren't as superhero oriented, or or kind of difficult to define. And mm-hmm. uh, but we should mention Valiant more frequently, though. Yeah, I mean, my gateway to Valiant actually wasn't even one of their superhero books. There's a book called uh, Britannia. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. uh, but that is like excellent, and it's like a nice. Little bit of uh, Roman history mixed up with um, a story about the supernatural, sometimes the supernatural. And uh, yeah, it's just a really cool book, but it turns out as you're reading it that it's actually connected to the larger Valiant universe. Um, it just so happens to be this book about this, what they call uh, uh, the world's first detective of Rome. So. Gotcha. Yeah. They, yeah. They, I mean, I'm impressed. They, I mean, they have Matt Kent and Jeff Lemire working for them. So, I mean, it's not like mm-hmm. they, they have any slouches in their. their no, they really don't. They're they're stable. Stable. Mm-hmm. Bullpen. Yeah. yeah, bullpen stable. <laughs> there you go. So, Sturge, you were saying you have nothing in the manga section. I am I am I I looked hard. I okay. read it twice. Okay. But. Um I I have a few things. Um okay. it's going to be relatively quick. And the only thing I have in Viz and this is on page 411 is mm-hmm. They're resoliciting a Kimi Yoshida's Banana Fish series, and I haven't read this, but apparently it is a really big selling Sojo title in Japan. Mm-hmm. And I, I looked it up; it's something that has been under my radar, actually. And I don't know if I'll get these, but it's something that I would definitely like to put on my wish list to read. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, this um the thing here with the the thing with his is uh. Banana Fish was turned into an Amazon Prime show. That's why they're resoliciting mm-hmm. this. Okay. And so, like, is it yeah, out the, now on Amazon Prime? Um, yeah, I think it already started. I believe. Okay. So yeah, I mean, this is um, trying to get people back into the manga itself, which um, you know, hopefully, I would assume is probably very similar to the anime. Okay. So. Mm-hmm. It sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, another thing I have in the manga section, <laughs> this is kind of interesting. Okay, on page 420, and this is listed under the Denpa Books publisher mm-hmm. section. Mm-hmm. And we've noted, or at least I've noted, some Denpa Book solicits over the past few months. And I've been impressed with what they're offering. But the thing that's interesting about this is Shintaro Kago's Super Dimensional Love Gun is listed mm. under <laughs> Denpa Books. Now, why that is interesting is for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, the episode that went up today, December 31st, as we're recording this, it was our last manga show, our December show of 2018. Shay and I discussed Kago's new book, or the, the translation uh, from Fantagraphics, the new translation, uh, Dementia 21. And in preparing for that discussion, because I hadn't read Shintado Kego before, I did order on Amazon, and I think it was from like a third-party seller, uh, a copy of Super Dimensional Love Gun. And Kego is known for writing the kind of manga that you would describe as iroguro or erotic grotesque. Okay, <laughs> but in addition to that. He's known for Iroguro Nansensku, or I think it's that's how you pronounce it. Maybe I'm butchering that, which means erotic, grotesque <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> and the nonsense part is definitely how you would describe the various stories in Dementia 21. Not so much erotic, huh. grotesque, but in Super Dimensional Love Gun, you definitely do have the Iroguro. So I just read this last week, and so it's rather timely. I'm glad that it's now becoming available through Denpa. The second thing that's interesting about this, if you look on the next page on, uh, what, 421, we see Uh a couple of titles from Faku Books. Now, the copy of Super Dimensional Love Gun that I have was actually published by Faku, and my manga co-host, Shay, alerted me to the fact that Faku puts out a lot of erotic or hentai kind of manga. And I looked up Fanku Books the other day on the web, and I saw a listing of their titles. Yeah, um, it's a kind of erotic manga that they're known for. Mm. But Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about 
the pseudo-dimensional love gun, which had been published by Faku, now apparently is being released by Denpa. Oh. And I don't know of any connection between Denpa or Faku. <laughs> But I do find this fascinating. This is actually this premise. Uh, it doesn't tell you. I guess it, I'm assuming it's an anthology of some sort. Yeah. Well, it's a collection mm-hmm. of what's called Kago's pretty girl stories. And okay. he published in various outlets over the number of years huh. stories that deal with young girls, pretty girls in one form or another. Some of them are slightly erotic. Some of them are extremely erotic. Mm. Um. <laughs> like there's one story in that collection called what the lamentation of the headless and mm. it's a story about <laughs> a young woman who when she reaches orgasm her head pops off and along with that her organs which are attached to her neck and starts floating around and it's it's based on an old folklore in in huh. asia and of course, as you can imagine, she doesn't keep a lover for very long because it freaks the hell out of them. And so it's a story about how she can't have a relationship because her head keeps popping off and she can't contain herself when she reaches orgasm. And so as a result, she is lonely for much of the story. But also, given the fact that it is her head that is floating around, I'll let you guys use your imagination. Um, the The head can do various things, not only to potential <laughs> lovers, but also to herself. Mm, and so, wow. I mean, it's just really mm. wild, but yeah. extremely erotic. And so there, there are a variety of those kind of short stories. Well, See? as someone, as someone who's currently reading prison school, I'm, I'm on board. <laughs> okay. See, yeah, I'm here to learn. Just, this is why yeah. I don't pick a lot out of the manga section. Cause I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm getting reacclimated to the world of manga. Cause I took a long break and, mm-hmm. uh, I, once I described uh, to a friend of mine the type of stuff I was reading, she told me to read Prison School, and she was correct. I love it. So I'm I'm trying to get my feet both feet back into the the manga pool. Cool. I'll have to check out Prison School. Yeah, it's 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 deliberately titillating and absurd. Okay. <laughs> And then the last two things that I have in the manga section and in the catalog as a whole are both new Kadacha books. Okay. Uh, the first one's on page 422, and this is the first volume of Sun Takeda's Gleipnir. Hmm. Okay. And the reason I attended to this is because it's a new series, and I'm wondering, oh, is this something I may want to jump on board on or possibly even discuss on a future manga show mm-hmm. with Shay? And um, it's described dark, disturbing, sexy, and shameful. This new sci-fi action manga <laughs> stars a dominating teenage girl searching for a sister who became a monster and a submissive boy with a strange power to turn into a ragged but powerful beast with a zipper down his back and compartment on the inside just big enough to hold a human body. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems like a wild premise. And then mm-hmm. on the next page, we have uh, the first volume of another new series in translation, and this is Yoko Nojiri's Love in Focus. Hmm. So it says it's uh, from the creator of the Times bestseller, The Wolf Boy is Mine, comes a feel-good romance, which is, I guess, <laughs> different from what I just read previously, <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> about a teenage girl whose passion for photography leads her to a new school, a new dorm, and a new love triangle. So they may be worth checking out. Yeah. I like I did this. Um, I'm going to try to say the name Glopner. Glopner. Uh, yeah. I like, I remember flipping through the book and like this immediately caught my attention. I was <laughs> like, what is this? And yeah, it's, you know, it's funny. It's one of those things where like the image is exactly what the premise of the book is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, Cause I wondered when I looked at that cover of Glopner, mm-hmm. what the hell is she crawling into? And <laughs> right. the solicit explains it. Yeah, that's exactly what you see. <laughs> yeah, I definitely read that one a couple times, and mm-hmm. I looked at it, and I was like, huh. mm-hmm. the premises seem odd, oddly specific to me. <laughs> that's, all I'm, that's all I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, this has turned out to be, as we expected, kind of a longer episode, to say the least. Mm-hmm. But, Troy, we want to thank you very much for joining in. This, this was, I think, a successful Experiment. I had said at the top of the show that we hoped this wouldn't be a train wreck, and I don't think it was by any means. We had a couple of technical issues, but uh, 
thank you very much for taking a part taking part in the January previews catalog discussion, and we hope to have you back on the show for other preview shows in the coming yeah. year. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm I'm happy to join you guys uh, at any time. Like, uh, yeah, I uh, just I want to point out that uh, you know I am here with Previews World, specifically PreviewsWorld.com, um, which is part of the Diamond Umbrella, of course. And uh, yeah, my job is to reach out to consumers and talk to them about comics, which is a pretty good deal. Um, and yeah, you can find us on, on uh, at Previews World on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, and be sure to tune into our weekly show, uh, Previews World Weekly, which I am one of the hosts, uh, every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Cool. Definitely check wow. that out. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Thanks, guys, and support your LCS. <laughs> That's right. Happy New Year. We're so glad to say May your days be very merry from the January day. Happy, happy new year from this January day. Gee, Derek, that was a great episode. I really enjoyed talking with you and Troy about uh, the upcoming uh, previews catalog. Yeah, it was. And it, it's kind of a longer episode than our normal long <laughs> preview shows. But I think it was well worth it. And having Troy on to talk about things, not only that go on behind the scenes at previews and at Diamond, but but also his take on mm -hmm. what he's specifically interested in, just as you know, we point out the solicits that really capture our attention. I think it really added a lot to the show. And I hope to have Troy on in future episodes in the coming year. I echo that. It was a lot of fun. So thank you, Troy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And if you want to check out any of the titles that we highlighted on this month's preview show, definitely go to the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to dcbservice.com, you will find everything we mentioned at incredible discounts. Don't miss out. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you think about our conversation with Troy and the January Previews Catalog. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can send us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Pick up your phone and dial 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. Or if email is your preference, you can email us both at two guys at comicsalternative.com. Or if you just want to email me, I'm Sturge at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also contact us via social media, such as platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google Plus, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Podcasts. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. It's your one-stop shop, stop. One shop for our stuff. That's right. And we do like to hear from you. You know, make it a New Year's resolution. Say to yourself, I resolve to contact Sturge and Derek and let them know that I absolutely love the Comics Alternative every week. And donate to their Patreon. Exactly. And in fact, in the, we keep saying that we're going to do this, but in the coming year, hopefully sooner rather than later, Sturge and I are going to revamp our Patreon program, and we will let you know when we do soon. It's our resolution to you. That's right. And ourselves. <laughs> Until next week, I'm Derek. And I'm Sturge. Take care. Peace. Let's everybody sing. Should old acquaintance be forgotten and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgotten and days of old lang syne?